At 6.30, we're going to call the meeting to order. We'll begin with the Pledge of Allegiance and the invocation. Curtis, you might adjust the mic slightly. This seems awfully hot. Michelle will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, and I will lead us in the invocation immediately following the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Join me in the invocation, please. Gracious Heavenly Father, among your many gifts are this day's daily bread and the opportunity for service. As beneficiaries of your graciousness, we thank you. Father, today is our first meeting of a new year. While we approach it with great hope and anticipation, we are sobered by the knowledge that fear and anger and joy and ever-growing chorus of voices of apprehension, distrust, and suspicion leading to the loss of civility, common courtesy, fractionalization, and hatred. These signs percolate from neighborhood to neighborhood, town to town, state to state, and nation to nation. Father, we ask that you replace this anger and fear with your love for others. Joy in living, peace that sheds alarms and doubt, and finally, patience to be steadfast in all circumstances. Father, it is only when we turn to you in our prayers that we can love those who torture us, pray for those acting beyond the bounds of civil discourse, and encourage those stunted by an evolving atmosphere of disdain. Father, please help us to remain faithful to your call to act for the common good, to show your graciousness to those we meet, to demonstrate kindness even in the face of torment, and to always act with the self-control available through you. Finally, we call on you to share with the many public servants here this evening your patience, wisdom, and judgment on each of the items before us this evening. And may our thoughts, words, and deeds be only those that you would have us pursue. Please continue to protect, preserve, and prosper our community, state, and nation. Amen. Amen. Item number three, citizens be heard. Um, Ms. Goodman, if you give your full name and your address, please. My name is Shauna Goodman, and I'm at 103 Happy Trail. And please. Okay, great. So um, I'm here to talk about um, 6.3, which is the Northwest Military Wall. Um, again, my name is Shauna Goodman. I live at 103 Happy Trail. My property backs up to Northwest Military and is next door to Mr. Basil um, Catchers. There are two areas on our walk wall that have become compromised and are dangerously close to falling down completely, much like Mr. Karcher's. Over the past two years, we've had to patch various parts of the wall, costing us several thousand dollars. We have a current bid to patch the current two locations, and it's over $12,000. I believe that we all can agree that the wall was not properly built, and therefore um, continuing to throw money at a structure that's going to continue to fall and is both ineffective and wasteful. I'm addressing you this evening to ask that you agree to the proposal um, City Manager Hill delivered at the November City Council meeting. In summary, the offer was for the city, Denton Properties, and the affected residents to split the cost of rebuilding the wall from the ground up correctly. Both my husband and I have agreed to this offer and wish to get the wall fixed as soon as possible. It is in both an eyesore and could become a, great, um, a greater problem if the wall fully falls and our dogs and our children gain access to Northwest Military. I ask that you consider Mr. Hill's proposal and let's focus on taking care of the situation in a timely manner. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. And Mr. Pross, if you give your full name and address and then tell us what you have to tell us. My name is Victor Press, uh, 108 Rock Squirrel in Chavano Park. So I'm here to speak about the wall as well. Um, I've been a resident and I speak for many other residents in this neighborhood, uh, in, in the city. I've been a resident here almost 40 years, so I know the history and I know the difficulties that have been involved in fixing this wall. But I think the city council has put off fixing it correctly, and sometimes a penny saved is a pound foolish. I don't know how many people go up and down Northwest Military each day, probably thousands. And what is their view? Their view is that the council either cannot afford to fix it, they don't know the history of it, 
or that they're not being, uh, the city's not being maintained. So it would be in the city's good to take care and fix this wall properly. Um, so I ask you tonight to consider the proposal that the city manager has put forward and that we have this taken care of for the good of the city. I think legally the, the, the city is able to do this and I think it would reflect poorly if we left it for months more in a dangerous and eyesore kind of situation. So I'm asking you to address tonight and approve the funding and approve taking care of this uh, problem that we have uh, on Northwest Military. Thank you. Thank you very much. Brings us to item number four, council member comments. Mike. Good evening, happy new year. Good to see everybody back. Marianne. Good evening, I appreciate you being here tonight. Bob. Happy New Year as well. Thank you for uh, everyone coming out tonight. We appreciate seeing you. Michelle. Happy New Year. Welcome. And Mike. Happy New Year also. Thank you for coming out. Hold us accountable. Thank you. Uh, and I normally don't speak, but uh, I was not at the staff brunch that the Women's Club put on this last week because of, uh, or the week before because of the flu. And I just want to thank the Women's Club. Uh, you are the anchor of our community. Y'all have served us faithfully and w uh, without any selfish or ulterior motives for years. You make our community special and you make our staff feel special and a round of applause to our women's club. <laughs> Brings us to item number five, presentations, commentations, and announcements. Uh, recognition, holiday event. Michelle. Uh, the only thing I wanted to say was I wanted to thank everybody who came out and everybody who participated. It was a great event. Um, we had lots of children and uh, lots of fun crafts and a wider age, age group of children, which I think was really um, uh, a positive thing. And I, once again, I just wanted to say it was a great event and thank everybody who puts it on. The staff does a really uh, good job and as do the volunteers and the women's club who works on it as well. So thank you to everybody. Thank you, and thank you, Michelle, for being such an important part of it. Uh, I really love the lady that you get to do the face painting. I think she is the most talented face painter in all of Bear County, if not South Texas and uh, South, South and South, uh, South and Southeast Texas. Uh, the next item is a proclamation honor, honoring Willowwood resident Tommy Flores, King of the uh, Especial Royal Court. Tommy, I'm going to ask you to come forward with uh, your friends and family from ARC. If you all would come on up here, and I'm going to read this out in front of the, the audience.
Now, before we get started on our agenda, our regular agenda items, I'm going to request with the consent of council that we move forward item 6.4 to be the second agenda item behind 6.1. That would mean that following our action and discussion concerning the audit that we will have the, uh, that we will have the discussion concerning the 2017 annual crime report. Do I have any objection? There being no objection, then the... Do I have an objection? You're saying to move 6.4, the crime report, up after the audit? After the audit, and then the other two items will follow immediately. I would, I would say we should discuss the wall before we discuss anything. I would move that up since the people that spoke tonight uh, came to hear about the wall. So I would be opposed to it. Okay. I, I, I mean, I don't know why you want to move it up. Is there, what's the reasoning? Uh, the reasoning would be that item 6.4, uh, 6.2 will, uh, will, or 6.3 will include an executive session before we come back. And if people are here to hear the police chief, that it gives us an opportunity for them to hear that and they can go along and then we can come back and pick up the other two items in the ordinary course. I'm even more opposed to doing it. I, I, folks came out to, to speak about it and if we have to go into closed session, we should do that quickly, come out, make a decision, and move forward. That's well, my opinion. I just, I've just always considered it to be rude to have people waiting out here when there are other agenda items that are of public interest. But uh, if there, uh, there being an objection, do I have a motion to, to reorder the agenda? I actually would agree with Marianne. I think since the people are here, we should move the, the discussion on the wall before any executive session. I, I would rather see that. But don't we need an executive session? We're going to need the executive action. session before we discuss the wall. There will, so we, the we, will, we will talk with the attorney before we talk with the citizens. Okay. I, I misunderstood that. And, and, and that may be fine, but I don't see spending an hour in closed session, and I think People are here, they came to hear about the wall. It'll take 15 minutes, 30 minutes at most to get a discussion with the attorney about the wall. Most of it was in the packet. People are interested in this and they came to speak and we should get I, it I, done and move on to the next agenda. Okay, item. I just uh, was offering that as a possibility. I know that it's People are always interested in hearing about our hearing from our police department, and if they were here for that, then I would like to accommodate them as well. And I'm not sure what every who I mean, two people got up and spoke about the wall. I don't know what the rest of the room wants to hear about. Okay, uh, it doesn't. I, I'm fine going forward with the agenda as posted. Then, uh, discussion, action, accepting the 2017 audit, city manager, Bill. So I, I know you don't want to hear from me, but I'll tee it up and then I'll turn it over to the auditor real quick. And I'm quick. also going to recognize Phil for his, as a presenter. <laughs> yeah. Just for background, so everyone's tracking, uh, this year uh, we went out and awarded a contract to Armstrong, Vaughn, and Associates to do the audit, and that's a change in an auditing firm. So this is the first year they've looked at us. Uh, they began their preliminary audit work in July, which is pretty early, and that was pretty good facilitated the audit. Field work concluded in uh, mid-November and Laura and I, but primarily or Laura and Phil's team, had worked to complete any uh, other requirements in the audit. Um, we received the draft report on 3 um, January and again um, went through a couple of finishing details. The bottom line is the report will be an unqualified opinion, which means the auditor did not detect any significant internal control breakdowns during the examination, uh, just giving you the definition of that. 
and uh, the auditor typically applies generally accepted accounting auditing standards to ensure the firm's internal controls are adequate, functional, and established to in conformity to the laws and regulations which we've met. So Phil's here, he'll discuss that. I wanted to highlight two points. Well, actually one point, the, the final general fund audited fund balance, and that's gonna relate to fund balance topic later on in the evening, uh, is $3,072,119, and that can be found on page 13. And uh, this balance includes two areas of unanticipated increases I wanted to highlight from the staff perspective that equals $208,000. Uh, one of those items is dealing with dispatch services. So uh, Bear County has been providing us dispatch services. We've been um, allocating $30,000 for that. We haven't uh, been invoiced for that. As well as none of the municipal uh, cities that Bear County provides that have been invoiced for that. And so um, again, we did some confirmation with the request of the, audit, uh, of the auditors to make sure that they were clear on that and there wasn't gonna be any change. And what they told us was uh, they will give us a year's notice sh should there uh, be a change and should they start uh, billing us for that and we'll go from there. So the money we had allocated towards that, we've moved back into unrestricted fund balance. Um, again, I'll just remind you that we, every citizen in, Sh in Chavano Park pays more taxes to Bear County than they pay to the city of Chavano Park. So. I consider that to be one of those services that we get out of Bear County in terms of dispatch services. The second uh, piece was franchise fees. And we get franchise fees from electric, gas, phone, and cable, et cetera. Um, we collected franchise fees in November, which were for services in July, August, and September. And so they've asked us to make an accounting uh, change to where we account for those fees. Um, that received, you know, and we received in November this year, but we're, we're crediting it towards those uh, uh, revenues we received last last year. So those those are two of the account payments there. So again, um, the requested motion is to accept the city of Chavano Parks uh, 30, September 30th, 2017 financial statements. Those financial statements are known otherwise as the audit and uh, from that, I'll turn it over to Phil. I'm sure you have questions from him in terms of that or not. Phil, if you want to come up to the uh, mic. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Council. Uh, this is everyone's favorite agenda item, sure. And Bill has stolen 90% of my thunder, so <laughs> you had a good write-up in your packet as well. Uh, in the Can you hear the microphone? Sure. Oh, yeah. Just lift it up, yeah. In the back of the financial statements that are in front of you, there's a letter that has some conduct about the audit, and it mentions some of the things that Bill's already talked about. One of them was the franchise fees, which is just the timing of when those revenues get recorded. Uh, really just an academic thing that makes me happy, but probably doesn't really float anybody else's boat. It only changed about $5,000 for your franchise fee revenue for the year, so it's really a minor issue. Uh, the other thing that in that letter on the bottom of page three is a our recommendation to consider pooled cash. I know Laura's very familiar with pooled cash. I know she's not gonna be here very long, but uh, it would be a good idea to consider it. And the main benefit of pooled cash is you really only have one account at the bank, but all of your funds and your accounting system treats it separately. And right now you have about 5.5 5 .5 million in spread across 12 bank accounts. And you don't necessarily need to have that much idle cash in those accounts. And if you were to pool them, you could reduce how much idle cash you have on hand and invest more of it. So just to give you some more numbers, five and a half million, as I said, is in 12 accounts, banking accounts, checking accounts, and you had about 3.3 million in your investment accounts, which are CD, Textpool, and Techstar. So you could shift, if you had pooled cash, more of that idle cash to your investments and earn a, a pretty good rate of return, as you are now. You're earning pretty good money on your investments, as, as we're talking about. So as those rates keep, continue to go up, as they have been, it could be quite a bit more money for you. Uh, the, the con to pooled cash is it can be a little bit more complicated. So if you have somebody that doesn't have governmental accounting experience, they not, may not be as familiar with it and may struggle with the pooled cash aspect. But you have an accounting software that's set up for it. Um, that's really just our recommendation. So 
uh, a thing you have to do, but something I would recommend you consider. Uh, the city does a really good job budgeting and projecting, so I don't know how much benefit I can really provide on the financial statements, but there were a couple of pages I wanted to touch on if you wanted to follow along. And uh, in discussing this with Laura, we picked, I decided, or I recommended, and she agreed to do comparative statements in the back rather than just having budget to actual statements. And on 54 is a comparative general fund statement, so it'll show what happened for your last fiscal year compared to the year before. Page 54. I'll give him a second to get there in case anybody else wants to read. And it's paper, page 54, so it's probably like 56 or 7 on the PDF. And the hard copy, you gave hard copies to everybody. Yes, there are hard copies up there. If you refer to the hard copy. Seven more pages. One too far. You went one too far. Yeah. There you go. So at the top, you'll notice that all of your revenues except for court were up this year, and they all beat the budget pretty considerably. Um, on your expenditure side, you'll see your total expenditures were the 4.8 million, if you scroll down just a little bit, in the general fund for 2017. That was a pretty significant increase over the year before, but a lot of that was capital outlay, that last expenditure line. That's where you buy capital assets. The largest of that 505,000 was an EMS unit for approximately 200,000. If you take those two lines out, mm -hmm. your expenditures between the two years increase 13%. And if you recall, this is the first year of your new salary survey, so the increases in the salaries made up almost the entirety of that increase in your general fund spending. Um, just below it, you'll see that you had some transfers in of 605,000, which came from your capital replacement fund and your crime control prevention district. Then you sent some money, the 251,000 back to your capital replacement fund, leaving you with a fourth line from the bottom of a $515,000 increase in your general fund fund balance. Getting you again to that magic number, Bill talked about the 3,072,000. 3, and I know your policy is to keep 50% of your future expenditures in fund balance and you're a little bit over that now. Uh, depending on how you want to calculate that, somewhere between probably 500,000 over. Uh, based on your 2017 expenditures, it was seven and a half months of your operating costs, so uh, somewhere in the 60% range of, of your fund balance. I know your 2018 budget is gonna chew into that a little bit, so that'll bring it down and probably get it closer to 50% by the end of 2018, just because of the increase in your expenditures and drawing down on it just a touch. Just also, just because I wanted, it's pretty significant. Um, we had some vacancies during the year, so overall in salaries, we were uh, didn't spend between public works, fire, and police 114,000. That's that's because there were some vacancies, so that's pretty significant in that area. So, so you're saying that could have been on top? Is what you're saying yeah. as far as what was planned? On the page next to it, if you flip to page 56, has your water utility fund, and it has your operations for, again, comparing 2017 to 2016. You know, just one more page. So you'll see that the revenues were up, which was completely consumption-based. There was just more water used this last year. And on the operating cost side, those were also up quite a bit, but the majority of that was your Twin Trinity well repairs. Uh, we discussed that with Laura and didn't think that that really extended the life of the Trinity well significant enough to capitalize it. So that's kind of in there reducing your operating income. But if that doesn't continue in the future, then you would have had positive operating income in your utility fund. But after paying everything else, all of your interest expense, you had some bond issue costs for the refunding last year, which did hit your utility fund for 76000 in 2017. But over the long term, you're still going to save 235000 over that on that bond. So you're going to come out ahead just in the first year. It doesn't look like you're coming out ahead. And then in the, the bottom of that page, you'll see your utility fund ending at $3.2 million. Now that $3.2 million, uh, a lot of that's tied up in your capital assets, and you have 956000 of that that's really available to fund your operations. It's not tied up in the water system. And about half, approximately half of that 
you've set aside for the capital replacements for the utility system. So it's about half unencumbered and half that you've kind of set aside for those capital replacements. But without boring anybody to death, I was hoping that was somewhat beneficial, but I'd be happy to answer any questions and they can help explain. Does anybody have any questions? I, I, Phil, I did have one little question and that goes over to page 16 um, where we're under contributing on our pension plan. And um, it kind of surprised me that we would have missed it by that much. Well, you, this is a little bit confusing and if you flip to, uh, let me get to the page. Uh, 46 and 47 has kind of the detail of your pension fund and 47 in particular what they do is they assign you a rate that you're required to contribute which TMRS says you contribute this percentage on the top of page 47 if you'll get there um, they they say you have to contribute this percentage but it's not necessarily the total amount that you would contribute or the total cost of your pension and TMRS sets that rate. You can choose to pay more if you want to, and if you'll, you'll see on that page, you've paid just a little bit more than you had to the last oh, we, two years. We have tried to fully fund, and that was the reason I was surprised that we missed it actuarially by $100,000. Sure. Uh, that's a major problem in many states and cities and communities across America. It's, Texas doesn't have nearly the problem other than the city of Dallas that other cities have. But as a community, we want to be very vigilant and make sure that we don't get behind the eight ball and, and not be able to manage our finances and let something like this get out of control. And it just struck me as a, uh, um, considering the way that everything else went, it was an outlier in the entire report. Sure. And Timur sets those rate based on projections. So they say, we think we're going to get this much in interest returns, and we think you're going to have this many people retiring, we're going to pay this many benefits. So they set your rate well in advance of the actual actuarial study. And then when it comes out, it's either much better or much worse. Um, your contribution rate is a little high, the thir 13, 14% range. It's not the highest that we have, but it's, it's definitely up there. Uh, we have some other cities that have contributed extra, a lot extra in, in the millions and they still have not seen any movement on that percentage. It, even over years, it hasn't really driven it down. So I, if, if I were the city, I wouldn't make it a focus to pay extra um, unless you can't live with the rate that they're quoting you to pay. And you're right that you have been paying the full rate. They give you a, a phase-in rate and a full rate, and you've paid the full rate. But it's still, it's not enough to meet their expectations of what, they, of what actually happens, So which is retrospective. So you'll probably see in the next couple of years a slight uptick in your rate to catch back up. Actually, I'd be surprised because the market has performed so extraordinarily in the last year. Um, You're right, that, and that's that a good the, point. That, text, that uh, TML has also exceeded to that because they now have a blended portfolio instead of a bond portfolio. Um, but it just surprised me that we were $100,000 underfunded for the year for our contributions, and that seemed strange. Sure. Okay. Uh, does anybody else have anything? Sorry, Bob. Quick question. Uh, on the consolidation of the accounts, which I think is an excellent recommendation, I guess I have a question. Um, our investment committee met recently, correct? They did. Is that something that, that came up in front of them or should? That's, I'll let An Laura answer that, but that's not really in the, Realm that's, of, that's not, that's an accounting right. means for that. Now, it has implications, just like Phil said, in terms of what you can do uh, with that. Um, and we, it, we, we, we actually went them in the meeting. It would help us because of, we just have so many bank accounts and just managing that money, I would be able to just take some more of that funds that are at frost and invest them in other ways. Just a little, it just makes it a little simpler. We, we, the ENCODE can perform pool cash. It, we do not have that portion of the module. So we would have to add that. It's not a lot of money, but just so you know, it, that piece of the module is not, we don't have it. Um, but it would also streamline accounts payable. When we do accounts payable, when we pay um, bills, it, if we pay for money that's coming from the crime control or Oakwell or PEG or all of those, we currently cut everything out of the general fund. It creates what people call do to who from, and I have to physically go to the bank and I do it once a week, sometimes once a month, it just depends on how it falls. 
and how what the balances look like. And I have to physically transfer the money from those individual bank accounts into the general fund to replenish it for that cash it paid out to pay that bill. So that would be a function that would be, not, you know, that wouldn't have to be performed anymore. So again, there is some setup on the ENCODE side and, and it would, it, it, it would though help again, being able to take some of that money and, and investing it a little bit differently. However, okay. not a fl it isn't just a f change, it's a, it is a flick of a switch with ENCODE and, yeah. and some setup. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay, if there's no further discussion, do I have a motion to accept the City of Chavano Park September 30, 2017 financial statements? I move that we accept the City of Chavano Park September 30th, 2017 financial statements. Okay, do I have a second? I'll second. Bob is seconded. We're now open for discussion. There being no further discussion, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Item 6.2, presentation of drainage improvement plan. Uh, Phil, thank you very much. We appreciate all your hard work, and uh, uh, Laura, we appreciate all your hard work in working with Phil to get this completed. Thank both of you very much on behalf of the city. Uh, item 6.2, presentation of drainage improvement plan and prioritization of funding options for consideration. Bill? So um, there's a number of things that I have in supporting material and in case you didn't get to the, the last attachments and the last documents, included in that was the summary from the P&Z's presentation to the city council a couple years ago along with the prioritization map. So I'm just putting that as background. Um, and just to kind of remind everybody, in, in January of 2016, P&Z provided that drainage prioritization concept which is in one of the attachments. Subsequently, we hired KFW as a city engineer and then tasked them to complete a formal drainage study. So at the uh, November meeting, which is really the last meeting we had since we didn't have a December meeting, KFW presented the final drainage plan to the city council. That plan did not include, you know, a, a, a implementation plan. It was, here's what your general requirements are. And so it's really up to the staff in consultation with the city engineer to come up with how we're going to implement this and what's the timing and how we approach this. So after the uh, November meeting, we had several um, planning sessions with uh, the KFW engineers. And we've created um, three general scenarios, which I'll talk about in a minute, for how we might approach that. Each, each uh, I call them options one, options two, and options three include phase one, phase two, phase three, and what you really see is different projects are uh, placed in different orders. So the first thing you have in your packet, which is on the screen now, is a summary of the projects as presented by KFW, which includes a prioritization list, a cost, and, uh, and whether or not there's a third party that's potentially uh, contributing to that. At the bottom of that, you see a potential cost somewhere around $10.5 million if you did the full cost of the project. I wanted to highlight that two of the projects, there is a cost to fully account for the drainage, and then there is a cost of a minimal accepted uh, option associated with that. That's areas three and four, Turkey Creek or Elm Creek. You can see that. Turkey Creek has a $5.4 million cost to it if you did everything associated with that. And then if you just did low water crossings over the, the roads associated with that, I think there's three of them there, um, then it would be $510,000. And uh, Elm Spring, which includes a, a stormwater sewer with a low water crossing, if you just did the low water crossing, it'd be 140000 so you have that for background. Um, so next slide. We did some further analysis that says if you take a, a look at the cost and then you count the properties that are directly impacted, um, and this is an approximate number, you know, you can see that just for points of observation, you know, the area one wagon trail depression, there's eight directly impacted and 
because of the mosquito problem and all that, there's certainly others that are affected besides that, but there's eight that are surrounding that area that are the most you know, impacted associated with that. And, you know, did we know about that beforehand? That's a new category I, we kind of added on there. Certainly we knew about it and it's been a uh, problem uh, for a long time. And just as a gauge, we kind of put dollars per property, back up please. We put a dollar figure per um, property associated with that so you can kind of get a feel. It varies associated and it also varies whether or not you go to the full blown cost or you use abbreviated cost. Some of the areas uh, deal with road access. So there's a column in there that if during a storm at the low water crossing, for example, the, uh, the passage and the road is blocked, then you're certainly dealing with anybody that wants access to that, all businesses, um, commercial, et cetera, and, and residents that live out beyond that. So that's where that cost is there. Um, going to first option. And, and let me just explain the options first. Option one, two, and three all include um, th three lower cost projects, area one, two, and five. Because area ones, two, and five are, can be done independently, they're not necessarily the same people that are going to do one or will be the same people that accomplishes two and certainly not the ones going to accomplish five. So all three of the options in phase one include areas one, two, and five because they're low cost and we can independently work through those. Option one attempts to in phase one, which I define phase one as FY 2018. Option one uh, proposes to deal with two low water crossings in effort to try to accomplish those two in this FY and would begin planning for phase two this year and I'll talk more about that later just so you can see that's the big task. Option two, if you just go to option two and I'm going to come back to option one in a minute. Option two basically does the three priority, uh, three smaller items but because of the PNZ proposed drainage plan um, prioritizing the municipal track as one, as the first priority, that would in, uh, take care of the, uh, um, basically the detention or retention area in the municipal track that would lead into Ripple Creek and would also deal with the Elm Spring Bikeway low water crossing. Now, in this case, we included the only, only the $140,000 minimal option in the bikeway, which is a low water crossing, because that's the only thing that's feasible in this FY to get done. If you tried to tackle the entire project, there's no way that you wouldn't get anything more than, you, you probably wouldn't even get the planning part done in consultation with the engineers. Keep in mind, in, uh, and I've talked to the, uh, the engineer, and he, you can ask him questions after I lay all this stuff out. Um, if we do the low water crossing, that would be complementary to a future project where you put the stormwater drainage in. So, in theory, you could do the low water crossing three or four years later, you could do the stormwater crossing in that piece. So, I, um, I think this is a lot more complicated and it's a lot more controversial, you know, uh, but since it was the first priority, I included that as option two. Option three basically says, okay, Let's take all the uh, low water crossings and let's just do all of them at once and we can probably save a little bit of money. As it turns out, it's not much. I'll talk about that in a minute in, in your um, deployment fees as well as your bidding fees. And so um, that also expends most of your money in, in associated with that. And then it leaves the two priority pr projects, area three and four, for future consideration in the next year. And then it leaves the municipal track in phase three, which is again, different than the priorities associated with that. Now having said that, anything that's in phase two or three uh, it is not really, I'm not asking for an approval for consideration tonight because really all I need to do is I need to get approval for phase one, which will then drive what I direct the city engineer which will then drive 
the budget amendment that we're going to propose because while we have the $1.4 million in the capital improvement plan allocated for drainage, for this FY, we haven't authorized the expenditure of any of those. So we go back. Now, just for background information, I asked uh, the city engineer, in terms of timeline to get this thing done, because I've learned that you just don't say, okay, go do it, and it, you spend uh, a month in, in planning, you go out for bid, and then it goes, it works. In this case, um, the engineering firm will do all the development of the proposals. He'll be coordinating with us, but they actually run the bid proposal, the selection process, and then oversee all that that goes on. But each one of these projects, which were recommended by the engineer based upon train analysis and the LIDAR that he has explained before and the information that we know before in site visits, all require an individual survey. And surveys um, to deploy will take about a month from the time that later use that survey information to develop the detailed plans. So for low water crossing, each low water crossing subsequently will take about a month to develop. So if we want to uh, go to two option, uh, option one where you go, let's bite off two low water crossings this year, buy off more next year, you're talking about a month to do the surveys, and then a month to do one lower water crossing, another month to do the second one, so you've taken three months to, um, to get to that. Five crossings takes five months before you even get into the actual uh, stakeholder bids. So what they do is they develop the project to a 70% solution, and then there's state owner coordination. Stake owners include adjacent property owners, the city obviously, um, utility lines, so CPS, which would have gas and water time, uh, if there's cell phone lines, require AT&T, Time Warner, whoever may be on that. So you typically take about a month to get into that input process with the stakeholders. Another month and a half to finalize the plans and then bid the project. There's another month, month and a half to bid it and award the project, and then there's a deployment, and then so you're talking about in, in basically seven months of design before you actually get out there and go do that. So, yes, ma'am. Is that time period that you're talking about an estimate, for example, uh, if we chose uh, option one, phase one, is that what you're giving us a timeline? Option one would be seven months, option three would be 10 months. Option two could be done in seven months if you didn't have a lot of uh, coordination with landowners, which I fear, I fear there's some um, landowner easement issues with option two. Uh, so that would be an added on. So seven would be the minimum plus any issues with landowners. Yeah. Let, let's, let's let Bill, let's let Bill finish. And I'm gonna also recognize Mike and our engineer in case they have something that they want to supplement when you finish, Bill. And I'm going to ask that all that you gentlemen come forward just in case council members have questions. So also. going back to option one, I just kind of want to lay out again. Wagon trail depression and the Kinman Bay way burn. The engineer, myself, Curtis, Brandon, as well as uh, Ditton Properties or Bitter Blue, we've been on site and we have recon that. We've been in touch with those landowners and there's actually some progress going, we're in touch with CPS, and we, we have a concept of how we want to do that, it still has to be surveyed, but we're moving on that, and we've done a lot of coordination, but you know, we had the holidays, and we're getting back from that. The, the Vento clearing is probably a uh, task order, uh, and having a clean crew go do that probably would take a lot of time. Um, but what this does is takes Chimney Rock and Fawn, which are in pretty close proximity, and does those two. And Chimney Rock, I think, is the one that has that the resident, there's residents that are cut off completely in high um, water events to where even EMS and fire can't get to them. And that, that system to be heard has showed up at this meeting several times and expressed that. We, as city staff, validate that as there's been several cases where, you know, it's been high and this would be, it seemed to me to be a more urgent, these two would be a more urgent uh, piece to that. Um, in this option, which could be changed, 
This NIT takes the next five little water crossings and says, let's target those. Okay. Um, that, uh, let's go back. One more, please. Um, again, what I am going to propose later on, I'm just going to let you see it in advance. I'm just going to tell you right now, I'm proposing that we, we, we authorize option one for execution, option two for, um, and phase, option one for execution, which would be phase one for execution, and phase two and three to a degree for planning, so that we start the planning now, and then we can then budget next year for that second uh, phase. So that's that's where I'm going to get to because you're going to see that if you buy it up too much, you're not going to get anything done in this year at all, and we've uh, just delayed it. Um, of issue here is ultimately, and Chris Otto and I talked about this several times. Uh, this project that's five million and um, and two point one million. That's the Turkey Creek area, which is really a lot greater than Turkey Creek, but it goes from Northwest Military Highway all the way through. And the Elm Spring needs to be further refined with survey, and we need to come back to you before you are going to be able to make a decision. And I, before I can make a recommendation that says I think you should take, you know, the the full price of that, that would be seven point five million dollars versus an abbreviated option, which would be a lot less. Okay, so that survey, that stuff needs to go on. But I, uh, you know, what this does is give me time to do that without delaying that. And in this case, if you were going to do the full up option, that could be a phase three, and that would require uh, some sort of debt funding or uh, other funding, which would be different. Okay, so option two, again, I already kind of talked about it. It focuses on the muni track and the detention pond and trying to prevent the water from going so fast into Ripple Creek. And it would also just do the low water crossing on uh, on, uh, on Elm Spring Bikeway. And then the only issue with that is well, it takes care of that first priority, but we all know it's a fairly controversial priority, which could be derailed. Or not. It could be derailed, it may not be derailed. And if you approve it, we'll drive on. I, I can't predict that, but there are some complications in terms of private ownership rights and some other things that have to be addressed. If, but if, if that all went smooth, you would have spent um, $940,000 and you have about $400,000 left. And so it doesn't give you a lot of options for the remaining project without, without debt financing. I put that in there only in respect for the Drinking and uh, Planning and Zoning Commission's recommendation that was number one party at the time for consideration. Option three, really says let's take care of all the low water crossings. We have the funding to do that. And then it, it says, okay, let's prioritize um, area two, uh, three and four as the phase two, because we know there's a real need for that. And we have some money left over, and that would give you time to choose, do you go full out or do you go minimal? Um, and then the only thing that option three wouldn't do is it doesn't really address the community track municipal. And so again, I say this two and three, phases two and three, that's a concept now. And after the, I, I fully expect what we come back and recommend in phase two and three is going to modify based upon the engineering study. But so to get to the bottom line, and Chris can back me up on this, all this, a lot of this, I prepared a consultation with him. We're going to recommend that you approve funding of option one for implementation in this FY so we get something done, which would be about $361,000. Then we've looked at the engineering costs that were provided in the survey by KFW. And so the engineering costs for survey and design of three low water crossings in Windmill, Bent Oak, and Cliffside are another $106,000. That's full engineering cost as well as the Turkey Creek survey and detail analysis that would be 40000 So the total amount for consideration uh, is $507,000 for authorization this year. I apologize we didn't get that in your, your packet. Chris was on vacation, I think, in 
Lord is somewhere with his family. And so we've done a lot of this coordination last couple of days. So two options if you choose option two op two considerations are courses of action for you to consider if you agree with option one, which is one, just just fund the cost to implement at three hundred and sixty one thousand this year, or two, fund the implementation cost plus the planning cost. Uh, and that would be a total of five hundred seven. Now if you go to uh, if you go to I think option three is the next viable one. If you went to option three, you could also uh, approve the implementation of the full cost, which is $1.17 million, and the planning cost for those other two. That would probably take most of your, uh, your $1.4 million. Chris can explain this more if you want. We would not accomplish most, we wouldn't accomplish anything this year because it's going to take so long to get the, the project details done, you bid it one time, and it, you're, really, you're going to be talking about it, you're going to be doing this in uh, FY 1819. So you'd only be funding the cost for engineering instead of here. So I hope I didn't confuse you. Uh, if you've got any questions, okay. you Chris. Uh, Chris, uh, Mike, if y'all would come, Chris, Mike, if y'all would come forward, and if you've got something that you'd like to supplement before uh, I open this up for a motion, to begin discussion, um, do y'all have anything that y'all would like to say? Chris? Uh, the only thing I'd really like to add on option three is when Bill and I talked, we talked about bidding all of the water crossings as one bid, um, just for economy of scale, um, which would put us into probably a December bidding, which is obviously next fiscal year. We could possibly do you know two or three of those to get a bid out before um, September. So we could get some bid out this year and then save the remainder for next year. Um, there's different ways we could do it. If y'all really wanted to get a project under contract this year. Okay. Uh, do I, Mike, do you have anything you want to add before we? Yeah. Uh, we took this item up at a public hearing and Bill presented us the same information <laughs> in our last God bless meeting. you. And uh, I, I wish y'all could have been present for the public hearing because the citizens are very vocal heard this, they want to do something about stormwater runoff, about flooding for 20 or 30 years, and they're tired of hearing it. I mean, we probably had an hour and a half long public hearing just on drainage, which for us is very, very long. So uh, when we had our meeting uh, in December, in January, pardon me, earlier this month, our recommendation was that we agree with Bill, we don't think we're going to tackle any projects that might have stormwater runoff from Military Highway because we really want the state to do all their engineering, all the work they can. We don't want to waste any money or do anything uh, that may jeopardize the work they do. So we would put off anything to do with Military Highway until they finish some of their engineering. Second, uh, although we didn't vote on it, we came to consensus that <coughs> that there's no reason to wait on these projects. We think that we owe the citizens some action as quickly as possible. And, and we really felt that we ought to go ahead with as many projects as our, as our fund balance will allow. But, uh, we think we ought to keep a reserve in there to make sure nothing weird comes up or we run out of money. But we really want to get to work and show the citizens that we're really serious about doing stormwater runoff and flood control in our city. So. Um, I think that's probably what we came up with. Okay, Bill, do you, do you have anything that you want to supplement after their comments? No, he's correct. The way I presented it initially, I did not have the detail about the timeline associated with that. So they were eager to go to, to option three, but it's re in reality, it's apparent that option three wouldn't get done. Now, option one, there's a real possibility that we're going to have it awarded and substantially completed by September. But I'm uh, talking to Chris, he, he's, you know, he, I'm going to, going to tell you, he's like, well, don't promise that because you could very well be finished in October, November. But it's the option one is the best way to get the ball rolling and then get, get things going. And then if you fund the planning for phase two, then we're really working on all these at the same time. And then we really tee up what is it we need to do for FY18? What are your possible funding sources for it, and then, then there can be some decisions made with, you know, more detailed engineering work. 
Okay. Do have a motion to open for discussion? I'd like to make a motion, and it's sure. not what's recommended. Okay. I move the city council approve staff prioritize and determine the use of up to one million dollars in the 2017-2018 fiscal year from capital improvement drainage as recommended in three options presented by PNZ staff and engineer for them to decide. Okay, so you're looking for a staff recommendation. Do I have a second on that motion? I'm looking for them to move forward. It's not a recommendation. It's okay. a directive. Uh, do I have a second on Michelle's motion? I'll second that. Okay, we're open for a discussion on Michelle's motion to take action and to implement projects. Um, Michelle, do you want to begin the discussion? I would like to say uh, it's not that I think you need to run out and spend a million dollars, um, but I think just as uh, Mike spoke um, residents have been waiting for this for years and years and years and years i've heard about it every year i've been on council um, i want to give you all the leeway to go and do what you think is best in the fastest amount of time i don't consider myself an expert at all in drainage you guys have done all the research so i trust you to go and get what needs to be done and prioritize it accordingly okay mike I think they've given us their their recommendation, and so I would make a an amendment uh, to move that we authorize the city manager to implement phase one of option one and submit an appropriate budget amendment to cover the expenditures. And if I get a second, I'll speak to it. Okay, Mike uh, is making a motion to sub substitute. No. Um, I think that it's a motion to substitute. It's a complete replacement of the staff but with a specific plan. So do I have a second on the motion to substitute? I'll second that. We have a motion to substitute. We're now uh, in discussion on the motion to substitute. Mr. Mayor. Mike? Um, the reason that I, I make this motion is uh, I'm a firm believer in crawl, walk, run. <clears throat> We're trying to do something that we haven't done, and we got to learn how to do it before we, we run uh, and spend, what, three quarters of our reserves to do it. Uh, and the low water crossings that isolate our citizens need to be addressed immediately. Uh, staff has already made that recommendation. I think that's a safety issue above all others. And so uh, I think this motion will also cover the, give uh, the city manager the leeway to submit a budget amendment that includes uh, the cost of planning for option two. That's what they say they want to do. I think uh, that going with, with their recommendation is a good idea, especially seeing as uh, we can we can deal with the the public safety issues first. Okay, Michelle. I want more flexibility given to staff and the engineers and uh, planning and zoning to move forward. If there's something in phase two that for some reason pops up and is easier to handle and move forward on than something in phase one, I want them to be able to do it without having to come back and explain it and just take care of it. They, we've spent years going over this. We've been crawling for years. It's time to get up and walk. Okay, uh, Bob. I think you. I just want to clarify. Uh, Mike, is that are you talking about the 507? So the planning and the the cost is that the I, I would anticipate it but the this motion would give the city manager the ability to come back with a budget amendment that accomplishes what this what, what he's presented okay do we have any other discussion Mike I kind of go along with the uh, option one uh, method with Mr. Simpson um, there's going to be a learning curve here, and I think that uh, these people have given a lot of thought to this already, and this does put the ball in action. Um, I know I attended the uh, PNZ meeting uh, earlier this month, and there was uh, a fair amount of discussion about uh, possibly seeking funding to do the whole thing because interest rates are so low uh, right now, and they may not be there in a few years. Uh, I don't know if that's something we can talk about. Uh, that's, that's that's a possibility. I think we should we should get these things rolling. I think this is the best way to get something done. In fact, excuse me, fast. Yeah, you could actually talk about that extensively if you want to, because it includes funding options. I do have a question, though, following on your question, uh, Mike. What was y'all's recommendation for planning and zoning? Did y'all have a specific recommendation? <clears throat> no, no, we really didn't. Our only recommendation was to move forward with as many projects as we could as soon as possible. Again, we, we were looking at spending a million. We, we recommended spending a million dollars. 
this year or as soon as we could, just, just to get as many projects started as we could actually get started. Now, it builds right. We didn't get presented a timeline. We didn't know how long it would take to get these items going. And that probably would have swayed some of our discussion if if we were to approve too many or we would spend too much money and they couldn't start anything in this fiscal year, we probably wouldn't like that option. We, we would like to do something to get going as soon as possible. Okay. Marianne? Uh, if I heard the discussion correctly, whether we budget a million dollars or we say go with phase one, option one, uh, $361,000, there's a time component put into this that no one really has any control over. If you're going to do a low water crossing, it's going to be a month, and there's going to be time involved. So to say, let's throw a million dollars and get as much done as you can get done, and let's go. We already know that there is time crunch involved. I, I like uh, uh, Alderman Colmere did attend some of the planning and zoning hearings, um, and I think the main consensus that came out of it, and I think what everyone up here agrees on, is that residents deserve action on drainage, and uh, I think we're ready to do that. It's just a matter of how. I am inclined to agree with Alderman Simpson in terms of the conservative approach that's put out mainly because when we first started talking about this, um, the dollar figure that was proposed, I think, was like three, five million dollars, and it went up to seven. Now what we have here is 10 million. So if we start with one project that we know has a time period, that's a conservative approach, that takes action to move the ball forward on drainage, that we know has a phase one cost of 361,000, Maybe once at the end of that, we can say, how well did that go? And how can we move forward with greater um, experience uh, with that under our belt in good planning? So I'm inclined to go with option one, phase one. Okay, do we have any further discussion? Michelle? My option doesn't limit it. It doesn't say you can't just do phase one. It says if you get through phase one or you find other options you want to work on in phase two or phase three that work into the timeline and the budget, you can go ahead and do that. Um, I just was giving staff more leeway to move forward on, on what they need to accomplish. But it doesn't matter as long as we move forward. Also, if we're bidding projects, we can be doing a number of these projects at the same time. So it's not like we're going to get one project and spend six months on it and just sit there and wait for that one project to be done. If we bid it to other vendors, we can be doing multiple projects. Am I incorrect? No, we can absolutely be designing multiple projects at the same time. <clears throat> um, and once we get one in construction, we just keep designing the next one so we never stop. And they're going to be done by third-party vendors. It's not like Public Works is going to be out there doing the projects. Oh, no, yeah, yeah we will absolutely be bidding these out to... To experts. Thank you. Okay. Do we have any further discussion? Mike? These estimates, are they uh, conservative? Or are they very realistic? Or are they added? Or what is, are there some hidden things that are not in these estimates? Because if we authorize, say, the million, which I'm, I'm not necessarily opposed to, but if these are if we run into some stack or a big problem somewhere down the line on any one of these these first grouping, you know, we might eat into that a lot more than just three hundred sixty-one thousand because the figures have gone up substantially in the last year. Or so. uh, the estimates that we did, I believe, were slightly conservative. Um, we did include contingencies in those numbers. Um, the economy is booming right now. Contractors are busy, and construction costs are going up. Um, that's my only concern is that. The numbers we used, um, City of San Antonio unit prices, uh, I believe they were 2015 numbers for the latest that they had available. It's still the latest they have available. Um, but I do know construction costs are currently rising. Okay. So there is proposal to go in to do infrastructure nationwide. What type of implication would you estimate, would you speculate? that that's going to have on construction costs of the type that we're looking at? The way things are going right now, I'm not sure. Um, historically, construction costs went up you know, 3 to 5% per year. Um, 
I know in home construction, I just finished building a house. Um, construction costs went up like 10% in six months um, in early 2016. Um, so roadway is not that volatile, but 5% per year is a realistic expectation. Okay. Uh, I would just say, Mary um, all we have to do, any of us sitting here, is look back at the water tower expense and what was budgeted, what we ended up spending. I mean, if anybody thinks that these figures are going to hold true and correct, we're kidding ourselves. That's not to say that we, we don't move forward or we go for the lowest or throw out the highest. It's just, I, I believe that this option, it's, it's the one that gets the ball rolling, that gets work under our belt, that gets things started. At the end of that phase one, we can look at it and say, here's how we did, here's how much we're over, and, and here's what we did in the meantime planning for phase two. Is there any further discussion? Okay, if there's no further discussion, we have a motion to substitute on the table from Mike Simpson to um, approve phase one, option one, with no additional monies allocated other than the $361,000. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Aye. Aye. Uh, the motion to substitute passes. We're now going to, now we're now in discussion on the motion to substitute as the primary motion. Do we have any discussion on the motion to substitute? Uh, which limits the amount that would be spent under the proposal to $361,000. Mayor, uh, just a point of clarification, yeah. because the way you read that was not the way I understood it from Alderman Simpson. That's yeah, yeah, that's the oh, I'm sorry, Mike. 361 and then have the option to... Well, no, the, he's instructing you to come back, but, but the, you, can, you always come back, I'm sorry. Well, uh, I come back and budget. For additional money. Which was all the planning for phase two and three. That doesn't require direction from council. That's an automatic. Well, I need, I need the he, funds. Didn't he draft something and hand it to you? He, he just did. Right. Option one, and to submit an appropriate budget amendment to cover the expenditures. So now we're into that discussion. But the amount is limited to option one's expenditures. And then he's going to make additional recommendations which we will then vote on as a separate item, but he will not have, we will not have instructed him to move forward on that. Okay, so we're open for discussion. Do we have any discussion? Mike. Uh, Mr. Mayor, the, the intent of the motion is to get going on, on phase one of option one and have them come back and tell us what we need to spend on phase two next year as part of the budget budgeting process. So it, it, it was by no means, there's nothing in the motion that limits the amount of money that's telling him to get these things going and come back and tell us what we need in the budget amendment. Okay, uh, which could either be, Mike, uh, the way that your language is written could either be submitted as a supplement for 2017-18 budget year or to be a part of our budget package for 2018-19, is that correct? What, whatever he says he okay. needs to get it done. Perfect. Bob. And, and I agree with that. The reason I said no on that vote is I don't want it to be limited to 361. I want to be able to have a planning and the funds used at that discretion. So I want to make that clear on the record. That's I want to, to approve that with the option to spend the money for phase two. Okay. Do so we have making an amendment? No, I, I think that, that that's just a clarification. Okay. Yeah. No, I, uh, I'm reading what Mike has here, and we're spending 361. That's yes. what y'all are voting on tonight. And you're asking Bill to come back and instructing him to come back with recommendations for additional expenditures, either in this budget cycle or, the, or a future budget cycle. Okay, any other discussion? Okay, if there's no further discussion, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. The motion carries. Item 6.3, uh, Chris, thank you very much. Mike, thank you very much. We appreciate all the work from planning and zoning. You guys do an amazing job for our community and. And thank you for being the chairman of the Planning and Zoning Commission. Um, item 6.3, discussion action, Chevrolet Estates, Rock Wall on Northwest Military Highway. Bill, I'm going to recognize you and Clarissa. If you want to make a presentation, and then you can make any recommendations from that point. 
Yeah, so I'll just start off by giving you some background. At the November 27th City Council meeting, the City Council directed the City Manager to secure a legal opinion concerning the implication of the repair and possible ownership of the wall. At the time, uh, the City, uh, Attorney Dan Santee provided, uh, and su subsequent to that, Attorney Dan Santee, who couldn't be here tonight, has provided a written memo which we provided to Council, uh, which has provided that in detail. So I've included a summary as uh, sentence in uh, for emphasis, um, and then and there was another update associated with it. I'll do that. So if the city decides to participate in funding the wall rebuilding project, the question was asked is whether or not the city will have some ownership interest in the wall or underlying land. In our opinion, no ownership interest is required. And Chris can talk more about that. In fact, ownership. Interest, with any ownership interest, the city chooses to accept it or also accept potential liabilities due to maintain to the maintenance of come with that ownership. The only other update I'd have is I presented to you two estimates last time. One was for approximately a repair of 180 feet, which would be was, was basically $60,000. A second contractor provided a cheaper estimate for 290 feet for $57,000. Subsequently, one of the property owners got a, con got a bid for 200 feet for $24,000. Okay, so if you chose the 200 or the 300 feet, you would be talking about, if you chose the 300 feet, and I haven't, I haven't dealt with that, that third contractor, you'd be looking at $36,000, and that's the only, only update. And at the last meeting, I didn't have solid, you know, agreement with all the landowners and their group, but I do have that now that they've all verbally committed to me that they would be a participant. So with that, you have the attorney memo, which um, um, you all have in your packet. The general public doesn't have an alternative over Clarissa. Mayor, Mayor Council, I uh, just wanted to thought it was important that we just take a few minutes in executive session to understand the new issues that Mr. Santee, my colleague, brought up in the memo. So I think it's appropriate for us, for us to just spend a few minutes so that way you can make an educated decision about how to proceed uh, based on the liability and the issues that he brought up in his uh, memo. So we'll take too long, but I, I think it would be behoove the council to, to take just a few minutes. Okay, uh, council has recommended that we go into executive session. Do I have a motion to adjourn and to, not to adjourn, but to, um, so moved. yeah, uh, executive pursu pursuant to 50, uh, 551071 Texas Open Meetings Act, consultation with attorney to discuss 6.3 agenda item. Uh, we have a motion by uh, Alderman Simpson and a motion, uh, second by Alderman Ross. To go into executive session, all in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. The motion carries. We'll make one now. It is now. It is now seven forty-three. to turn off the recorder. And then we need to pause that. It is 7.57. We have been in executive session pursuant to, pursuant to Texas Open Meetings Act 551.071, consultation with attorney to discuss uh, agenda item 6.3. Uh, no actions were taken, no votes were taken, 
and we are now returning to our regular council meeting. Okay, I'm going to entertain a motion yes, to begin discussion on item 6.3. Yes, yes Mike. I would move that we find repairing the wall to have a public purpose and that we authorize the city manager to expeditiously coordinate the repair of the fallen portions of the rock wall on Northwest Military in cooperation with the property owners and Denton Bitter Blue, with Denton or the property owners to take the lead in the city to contribute not more than $20,000 to be taken from fund balance with the remainder of the cost being borne by the other party. Okay, we have a motion to find a public purpose and to contribute no more than $20,000 toward the project. Uh, and I'll read the full thing again after we vote on it. Thank you, Mike, for the motion. Do I have a second on the motion? Okay, Mike has made a motion and Bob has seconded the motion. We are now open for discussion. Michelle. Uh, first of all, I'd want to change that, amend it to be a third of whatever the cost is, because if it's 24300 I don't think a city should pay $20,000. Um, so I'd like to do that. Also, while we may decide there is a public purpose, I don't honestly believe there is one. Aesthetics is not something that the city needs to intervene on. I've called a number of residents up and down the Northwest Military and others and what people don't understand is this property it, it's it's private property it's not city property and what i've had is uh, shadow creek residents and Bethel manor residents saying to me well that's great then our hoa shouldn't have to pay to put the wall up if the walls fall down whatever is our our area then why would the city fix those i don't have an answer for that um, also there's 3300 feet on Northwest Military, and that doesn't include De Zavala and Heapner, which could also fall down. And the final top subject is people north on Northwest Military have a whole myriad of different fencing options facing Northwest Military. So I've had people say to me, well, why don't you replace all of the wood and the whatever along Northwest Military up to 1604, because that would all look better. Yeah. So, Bill, has, has there been a, any type of um, inspection of the wall to determine if the problem that exists along Northwest Military also exists along uh, Northwest Military and along the properties that surround Bentley Manor and Chavano Creek. Have y'all looked at those? The, uh, yes. Uh, the properties, in, well, first of all, there's a couple of questions you just asked, but Bentley Manor and Chavano Creek were built differently with a foundation inspected to standard and so forth. Um, and, and I'm only asking that as it relates to this wall to differentiate the two because we're talking about this wall. I want to understand what the problem is on this wall, not do we need to fix other walls. I want to understand what, the, what happened here because this wall is crumbling and all the other walls in the city are fine or they look fine. They're newer. Again, uh, I've attempted to research that to the best that I can and talk to Laddie and so forth, and I've kind of briefed you on that before. This was the first wall of the section the city was done. Subsequent to that, they did the Hubner and then they did the Days of All. Um, our inspection shows that it's constructed differently and a lot more, uh, you know, I'm going to call it solid. Um, I don't have uh, a subject matter expert opinion on it. it's going to last X long or is not. Uh, the section that goes along with Northwest Military Highway, in your summary, there is a number of, there's an assessment that was done, it's not scientific, but it uh, says that you have the majority of that wall in good shape, you have some that is in fair, and some of these be repaired now. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry I stepped in there ahead of you guys. Uh, do you all have any discussion? Mike. I just wonder if uh, a soil test in that specific area might be needed to see if the soil itself is too plastic to hold that wall, period. Um, I, I don't know if that's part of it. Also, if, if, we, if we buy into this, uh, what is the guarantee of the, of the uh, contractors? Are they gonna, if it falls, are they going to fix it? Is it going to be their responsibility? How are we going to get out of this? I think this is a dangerous, slippery slope. I think it could lead to a lot of problems down, downstream, and, and I, just, I just don't think we should do it. 
I think we should stay out of it unless we're really sure about what we're getting into. And we don't know whether that, that soil can actually hold that, that wall at all. Okay. I'm sorry, but we don't recognize people from the audience. Uh, that was why we encourage people to talk at the very beginning. But Mike? Um, first of all, a clarification. The motion said not more than $20,000, not $20,000. So if it comes up to be $24,000, it wouldn't necessarily be $20,000 from our, our budget. Uh, number two is we had a discussion last time um, and I think the, there was a consensus that there was a, a public purpose to the wall and that being a presentation of Shabna Park and its uh, standards to the folks coming into the city from the south. So that's why I made the motion that we find a public purpose to, to this. Um, it's been sitting around too long, it's time to get something done, and so this is what we're doing. We're telling the city manager, get her, get her done, and uh, let, let's, let's work and, and, and make, it, make it work well, and work with the property owners who are our neighbors, and work with uh, Denton Bitter Blue, and share the, the pain, and, and just treat each other like the neighbors, and get her done. Okay. Uh, so, so, Mike, I'm going to ask you in light of what you just said, uh, because I do clearly see that it says not more than $20,000, and I'm going to ask you if you would be interested in clarifying that to say one-third, but not more than $20,000. Well, I'm just leaving it up to the... Up to the city manager. City manager. Okay. You can get it with one quarter or one-tenth, and that's fine. Okay. Uh, do we have any further discussion? Marianne? I have a lot of questions and, and some comments. First of all, I don't see how we can say this is a public concern and then ask residents to pay for anything. We don't give them any control over what it's going to look like. We don't give them any control of how big it can be. So I don't, I don't know how on one hand we can say this is a public concern and then on the other hand request that residents be on the hook for any of it. Um, my questions come from the, the staff summary where we have some documentation that shows that in the 80s, um, and, and don't get me wrong, that's not to say that I'm, I'm looking at the city for this bill, okay? The, the questions that I have are, in the 80s, the developer intended to build a rock wall. And they built one. After several years of complaints by citizens, they rebuilt it. Who paid for it? Who paid for that wall the first time it was built? So you asked me a couple questions. The first thing had to do with the uh, property owners. Well, no, I, did, I didn't ask you any questions okay, except for who paid for the wall when it was initially built. My reply to your first comment was the property owners, you said that... Uh, They've been coming to me um, constantly associated with... No, no, to I'm just reading what was question, in the staff summary bill. Right, to to answer your specific so. question, Denton communities who develop the Chabonneau estates there, um, as told to me by Laddie Denton, proposed a six-foot rock wall. Who paid for it? They did. Okay. They proposed a six-foot rock wall. The city at the time... Um, gave them guidance. I don't know that there's any action associated with this that they were to build a two foot wall and then to have this four foot section associated with it. After four years, the city came to them and says, The citizens are unhappy, we want a six foot wall. Didn't pay for that to go up to the six foot wall. The problem was that the foundation associated with that wall was not, there was no foundation built associated with that yeah. there was a thin foundation that was not meant to hold a six foot wall. So this information comes from an agreement between the city that's documented and written down. Nope. It's just a handshake, friendship. We've been I don't know. working together for so long. I mean, 37 years since 1980. What, which agreement? I mean, that's what I'm asking you. Is there any agreement between Denton and the city about that wall? 
Not that I'm aware of. Okay, so it's just a handshake. Well, I wouldn't is that say fair that. To say? There is, there is in the covenants. There is discussion of in certain covenants. There's three separate covenants for the estates. And who drafted those covenants? Didn't communities, and some of them address the wall, and some of them address the fence. Right. They, they do. They're, they all address the fence, and that's and the wall, and, and that's the question: is Den drafted those covenants? They run with the land, they impact the landowner, and they say, we're going to build this wall for you, but you're going to fix it from here on out. And you don't get a say in what it looks like, and you're going to put the city in a situation if it has to be rebuilt and fixed over and over and over again. I guess what I'm kind of getting at is, why does the city have to be on the hook for this at all? Why do residents have to be on the hook at all? for this at all, why can't we go to our good business partner and say, you're on the hook for this. You built it. It ain't working. It hasn't been working. It is an aesthetic issue because it looks awful for months at a time. And it's sitting there, falling down. What does that say about our city? And who built it? Twice. Is anybody from Denton here to answer questions for us? I have talked to them pretty extensively. And they drafted the covenants, and they built the wall, and I, I don't know why we don't ask them to fix this. Well, they're deed covenants, which allows each homeowner who is a part of the development project that was involved in that particular phase for in Basil's case, uh, for his house, uh, for for Shauna, her house, and for anybody else for their house, uh, anybody who is one of their neighbors that had their houses constructed at the same time would have the ability to come in and to sue them over the deed covenants. Um, the confusing thing about the deed covenants would be at the moment that the deed covenants were prepared, the wall was two feet tall. And it had a, uh, and it had uh, a, a fence above that that was something like hog wire on um, on cedar post and so as far as what the homeowners and what goes with the deed uh, I think that there's an excellent argument that the only fence that anybody was ever obligated to maintain was that fence because I'm very seriously doubt that there was any type of document that got executed by anybody or that was requested by our city uh, uh, staff or by our city council at the time that the wall was raised and the wall was raised somewhere around 1990 1992 somewhere in there it says 1980 no no it wasn't 1980 because i lived here when the wall was taken up from two feet to six feet so i, I know that it was the wall was not built in one stage it was a two foot wall and then it took it and then it went up from there and um, that was done at the request of the city council as a concession for other items that I'm sure that they negotiated with Denton communities at the time <coughs> so the Denton communities paid for hundred percent of that cost so we have a wall that was completed in two phases we have homeowners that have have deed covenants that go not to the city but go to the surrounding neighbors to fix this. Uh, we have a developer who recognizes that whoever put this in, uh, there would be a product liability for home construction items that would last for 10 years, which has now lapsed a decade or more ago. Uh, and so they're no longer, nobody's lo nobody is on the hook to pay for this, except we have a number of homeowners who live along Northwest Military, who look in their backyards and they see distress and their neighbors feel distress for them and their neighbors realize that if you leave something like that for an extended period of time, it makes it look like Shabano Park is a trailer park and that we're driving through a trailer park when you get there. And what I believe Bill is suggesting is that uh, we have a cooperative process. We have a developer who has agreed to contribute money and has no legal obligation to do so. We have homeowners who have been injured who may have some personal liability for this as it relates to the rock wall and as it relates to their neighbors. And we have a city that 
Our attorneys have told us that we may find a public purpose in this entire endeavor. And so it is up to us to make a decision of, number one, is this a public purpose? Number two, do we want to participate in fixing a problem that nobody in this room caused? But everybody on this side of the dais can help to accommodate and to have a solution that not only serves our neighbors who live along Northwest Military, but every one of our neighbors who drive along Northwest Military every day. That's an argument that came up before a similar council in the past and, and didn't go anywhere. So, you know, the, the question that I have is, is I personally think it is a public concern and I think that it would be great if the city could fix it. My obligation, I think, as an elected official is to say who paid for that, who paid for it initially, who built it, who paid for it, it says in the documentation that Denton Communities has routinely built masonry walls where the wall encloses private property, but in highly visible, uh, it is highly visible from roadways because it obviously improves the community look. What do they do for those other situations? Are they on the hook for the maintenance and repair and fixing that? And if they are, why don't we ask them to do that here? So the residents don't have to pay for it and the city doesn't have to pay for it. I'm going to give you my best uh answer. Honestly, yes. I've asked them, and but up until this point where the city has agreed with the landowners, they have said no. And now that they have seen that, so to speak, that there's a stake in there from the property owners of the city, they've agreed to this limited um, um, improvement. And they've seen the documentation from the insurance company that shows that the person and the people and the folks that built it because of the construction, the way it was built, that's what caused the issue? They don't disagree with that. I have not showed them that uh, personal, uh, that, that insurance documentation, but as he said to Lad, he said to me, I intended to build a six foot wall. When you build a two foot wall, and then at the request of the city, you put four feet on top of that. At the request of the city, and where's that request? Right? Where is it in writing? Who has it? Who can show me anything well, that I, says the city and, and the developer agree to this? I'm not, I'm not the And I'm not attacking you, I'm just saying. I'm Why just don't asking most those of those are, most, A lot of what goes on between what we get Denton to do is done through collaboration. A handshake, and they've been doing it for 30 plus years, and that's fine, that's great, but why don't we ask them to pay for this? I have asked them, and you're, I'm going to tell you, they're not going to agree to pay for the whole thing. And, and, and I think that this and why, why not? Could they come before us and give us an explanation as to why and, not? And the reason why is because just the stretch of 33 uh, feet uh, along, 3,300 feet along Northwest Military would cost them over half a million dollars. Is there a reason why we can't get them to come to this council and answer questions for us? I mean, not one person from Denton could even appear tonight knowing it was an agenda item. Okay, I'm going to defend them because Laddie called me and said, do you need to be here? I said, no. All right, he's agreed to pay for one third. I didn't anticipate if you wanted to, so I, you might apologize. Yeah. Um, and and it's, not a, it's not a, I'm not attacking Denton either. I mean, obviously they've been a great business partner for the city. They've made, also made a lot of money here doing what they do in the city. Um, and we'll continue to do that until their development is done. Um, I, I, I think it's reasonable when we have an insurance document that says the construction materials and the construction was faulty and that's the reason why the wall fell down. They have built it. We don't have any documentation to say uh, what the arrangement between the city is except for now uh, basically a handshake and we've been doing this so long together. Let's work something out. I don't understand why, I mean, maybe if given the opportunity to come before council publicly to answer questions about it, maybe they would surprise us all and agree to pay for it. Yeah. Uh, Clarissa, I have a question for you. I know that you're a litigator. I don't know that you do any uh, home construction work. I've worked with a number of construction attorneys at Langley Benack over the years, and I understand that home construction has a 10-year statute of limitations for de defects in construction and materials. Um, what is your understanding? Because, frankly, if they use substandard materials and the insurance report says that it's substandard materials, it's like your house 
having the roof collapse and it's after 10 years. Texas law says there's a 10 year limitation period for, for defects in workmanship and materials. Is that your understanding what the law is? I think so, but I would have to defer, you know, and look, look that up because I don't practice in construction law and I would, I would hate to state something that I'm not 100% sure about. Yeah. Okay. And, and so what you're asking, Marianne, is that, <clears throat> that out of the goodness of their heart because they contracted with somebody that obviously got it wrong and we now have a period of 27, 25 to 27 years that have lapsed since the improvement was made to the wall that we even that that business is still in existence and that didn't that didn't basically ensure that all those defects are fixed Denton runs into defects in properties all the time and after they turn the keys over to people Denton communities is are the the builders are the ones that are on the line for those not to not to defend Denton communities against our citizens but uh, you know, you're you're asking somebody to basically make a gift of a walk, rock wall to the city and well, to accept it. Well, they've done it twice before. So uh, I don't know why. Look, we can we can do whatever you guys want to do. Um, I'm not asking any of y'all to answer questions on behalf of Benton. I'd love to ask Benton these questions. Um, if Benton doesn't want to come. They, they've paid for the wall twice before. I don't know why they're not going to do it again. And, uh, you know, we as a council collectively haven't asked them. I'd like the opportunity to do that because I want to get this fixed. Okay. Not so, just for the neighbors, but for our community because they, it does look better when it's fixed. The, the two times, I just want to clarify that. The, the initial construction, is that the first time? And the second time is when the hearsay, the uh, lore of our community is that in the late 1980s, the early 1990s, the city council went to them. No, I'm, I'm asking you, I'm, 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 I'm trying to clarify the two times. Because I don't think, I, to, I'm asking you what your thoughts are, because I, I you said twice. Straight from the documents. You said twice, this. and the twice, the twice would have been the initial construction, the initial construction, and the improvement to six feet. Uh, I don't think that they have stepped forward to replace any walls or improve any walls on defects that have happened in the following 25 years. I'll, I'll Mike, I'm listen. sorry. I'm, I'm reviewing what was, what was provided to us in the documentation. Uh, I've asked and it was answered twice. Okay. They paid for it twice. The other thing is, is I'd like to know they routinely build masonry walls where the wall encloses private property uh, and they do it all around here. All around here, you see it in construction everywhere. Yeah. And so they have those walls. I'd like to know what the arrangements they have with those, those others. And, and it's mainly just, you know, if, if I agree also with Alderman Comir in that this is a slippery slope in terms of if we agree to spend this money, uh, you have admonished me on many a, an occasion about let's not bind the hands of future councils. And in um, this case, we wouldn't be binding the hands of future councils either. Okay. Well. I thought Mike, there was. Excuse me, I wasn't finished. But, but you, you, okay. If you would get to your point, please, so that we can, because you have said the same thing several times. I'd just like to, I'd like for us to move forward. Okay. I, I would have liked for them to be here for us to ask questions. Thank you, Mike. Just a point of clarification on the engineer's report. I'll quote it. It is our finding that the east property line stone wall, that what we're talking about, has not been damaged by the wind event of October 28, 2017, but resulted from quality of materials and workmanship and aging of the materials, normal environmental, parent, sun and rain, closed parent, and seasonal, parent, wet and dry, closed parent, cycles occurring over the years and is not the result of any single weather event. That's the engineer's conclusion, is that he didn't say that it was shoddily built. Uh, he just said that it was not as a result of a, a weather event. So that's, that's what the engineer has in front of us. Okay, does anybody else have any 
points to share with us. Bob? So I am very against doing things on private property as a, as a, as a rule of thumb. Um, I don't think that's our role as elected officials in a government, but I do think this is a public purpose that is very, very unusual. Um, and my first, and I really appreciate the questions that were just asked um, by Alderman Heisel because that would have been, my question is why was this not paid for? Who did the work and why is this not warranty? What does insurance have to say about this? Many of those have been answered, but we still have unanswered questions and I don't think, unless we drag this out for several more months, will be answered. Um, and I do believe that it is a, a city nuisance. Um, I have had feedback from, from residents. We've obviously heard it up here. We've gotten letters. Um, <coughs> and it's my assessment that I think it's, although I do think there are some longer term issues with, and I don't think we're obligating any council particularly, but there's always the option that uh, down the road, uh, another part of this wall could go down. There's issues with with uh, warranty uh, in, in, in the repair of the wall. There's other things that we, as a party to, could get involved in at later later times. That concerns me, but I think overall, I think it's the right thing to do uh, for our city and for the residents that are affected, um, and I would support it. Okay. Michelle? And the only other comment I have is for the residents like Basil, who has, re he's had that wall, because I live right across from it, repaired more than once. And so whoever's repairing it isn't, they're just patching it together because it keeps falling down. So it's not being done as a quality repair. I, I don't understand. And then I'm it's also... Yeah, well, no, it's part of the same section. <laughs> Trust me, I've seen it over and over. Um, and, and then they put the metal things up to try and hold it, and then it fell through that. Um, my only other concern is whether or not when Northwest Military builds is, or does stuff, is that going to cause jackhammering and other stuff that's going to cause issues? I don't know. And so if there's going to be some sort of involvement, there needs to be some sort of warranty or some sort. And they're not going to warranty if TxDOT comes in and does. So I, I'm just, you know, yeah. putting those out. Bill. The current proposals I have is to remove, you know, 300 feet, remove it, put a, a new foundation to standard, and build a new wall, not to repair it. Mm -hmm. uh, I have specifically asked TxDOT how they're going to uh, widen that road and the implications associated with that. Now, you know, I don't want to guarantee anything, but, you know, at the southern part of the city where you have the escarpment, so to speak, where you have a cut in. Their proposal is to, I mean, as it is now, to limit what they're going to, we haven't seen this 70% plan, but they're going to try to limit what goes into that and, and the heavy machinery moving into that. And then as you get up north, it becomes less of a problem associated with that. They didn't anticipate that there would be a problem. There. That's not to say okay. that there's some areas that didn't do that. Um, and just, we can continue this later on, or we can finish it tonight, but Denton has made it a point to, in their uh, documents as they build the subdivision, they build the wall section. And in the case of Shadow Creek and Bentley Manor and Willowwood, they deed it to the Homeowners Association. The Homeowners Association has ownership of the wall and then responsibility, they take out insurance Mm -hmm. And typically, their insurance is paying for the wall. And so there's a difference in that um, this is the, the, the property owner's responsibility. And I'll close it at that. Yeah, I think that what you just said is that instead of it being 12 people that pay for the wall, there are going to be 400 houses that pay for the wall. 400 homeowners. And so the, it's kind of like what we've been talking about on the public purpose that we as a city are sharing that responsibility with all of our neighbors to get something that is a public eyesore at this time. I believe one of the, one of the council members referred to it as a, as a nuisance. Um, and it certainly has a nuisance aspect, but 
as a nuisance, I would hate for council to consider uh, the step of, of seeking a nuisance action against the 12 homeowners because that's just not the way that communities treat each other. And so we're caught in a situation where we can negotiate to see if we can't get Denton communities to bear more of a cost and us to bear no cost. But we also have the opportunity this evening for a manageable amount of money to come up with a solution that I know it kicks it on down the road, uh, the can on down the road, but it's a, it's a problem that may not have come up at, well, that won't come up more likely than not in our lifetimes for the 300 feet and may not come up again for a council for 10 or 20 years. And in government, that's what you call a success and that's what you call a solution if you can get those 10 and 20 year solutions. So I'm hoping that council will find a way that we can find the public purpose, that we can move a $20,000 issue a maximum issue, uh, make maximize, uh, place a maximum cap on this issue of $20,000 and seek a solution that's a final solution on this. What is, what is the response when um, Huntington, Willowwood, Shadow Creek, Bentley Manor, somebody runs into their fence, which has happened, uh, and their dues, uh, homeowner dues pay for that? What is the, our response as a council going to be when they come and say, and now I'm also going to be paying for this other fence? Well, if I could and, speak and to really, that. I'm asking the rest of you know, my public yeah. colleagues. Well, the, the, way that, the way that Shamino Creek works is that the well, people really, that run really, into it, really, and, and they've had several... Fair, really, I'm asking my voting colleagues. Well, and I'm okay. answering first because I have the right to speak just like everybody else, and I am a voting member on occasion. But on Shavano Creek, and I know this from personal experience because my son dated one of the girls who ran into Shavano Creek's wall <laughs> twice. And so, you know, it's like, okay, what happens? And I, I was curious because I'm curious about lots of things. And her insurance paid for the replacement of the wall. And if it had been an uninsured motorist that had run into the wall, then Shavano Creek had insurance to pay for the balance of the repair on as a part of their overall property damage issues. Now, I know that they're having to pay for insurance, and if we were to take responsibility for all walls in the city of Shavano Park, that they wouldn't have to pay for that insurance. But that insurance is a nominal cost because most times, automobile coverage is going to pay for the damage to the walls. But I have now spoken, and every other council member may now speak as to what the status is on what happens legally when somebody runs into a wall. No, really, my question was not that. It was, what are you going to do when your neighbors from the homeowners associations come and ask? That's one question. The other question is, is there any desire on this council's part to even convene a special meeting and ask the Denton uh, folks to come and answer those questions? If there's not, then let's go ahead and vote. Just Are you making a motion for that? Mike? Input from my colleagues. I guess my answer to the homeowners associations that would come to me and ask me that question no one has uh, is you want to live in a gated community, you take, take the responsibility of the gated community, you, you have a homeowners association and, and that's the way you chose to live. We don't have one in the estates. Um, getting Bitter Blue to talk to us, that's fine, but I don't think that, I, I would be more than happy to ask them the questions, but I would not want to delay getting something going in order to do that, especially seeing as I'm gonna be out of town for two weeks and wouldn't be able to participate during that time. That would be my, my answers. Okay, anybody else? Mike? I agree that I think the, the primary responsible party here is the developers, but it's been so long, I don't think we're going to see any fruit of that. Um, I personally, before we moved into Shadow Park, 
We looked at a number of houses that had walls around them in the backyards. And the first question I asked was, who's responsible for that wall? And about half of them, you'd be surprised, said the homeowners are responsible for maintaining and repairing those walls. And I said, no, thank you. Because you look around, and very few of these walls stay up. They start leaning. Um, I just don't, you know, I mean, if you, if you bought the house, you should have known what you were getting into because it's, it's in the deeds. They're responsible for it. It clearly states that. Is it, a, is it a fair deal? No, it's not. It's a bad deal. But it's, it's the risk that you take. And I know that Basil has repaired that same section of wall several times because he's put in the last time, just about a year or so ago, the pipes on some of it. And it leads me to believe that he wasn't honoring his deed restriction that says you have to, you know, repair the foundation to support it. He should have done that at that time. Um, I just think this is a dangerous thing for the city to get into. I think we're going to wind up with some down the road uh, damage control, of, you know, maybe maybe from one of the HOAs. Um, they're going to say, you know, that they're sitting over there. Half those people maybe never even come down with what's military a lot. We're sitting up here, all six of us. We live on this side. We, we, we live, most of us live within just hundreds of yards, in some cases, of that wall. We're used to it. I'd like to have it there, but I don't want to pay for it with tax dollars. I'm sorry. I just don't think that's a good move. That's my personal opinion. I just don't, I won't, I won't vote that way. But um, if we could get better blue to pay for more of it, help, help go 50-50 with it or something like that, I mean, that, that's fine. Help negotiate it. Wave permits. Help them however we can. But I, I just don't think there's going to be a lot of people in Memphis Manor, Willowwood, and Hunting, they're going to be real happy to have their tax dollars spent to repair a wall they don't have anything to do with. Okay, Michelle. It isn't just the HOA neighborhoods, um, and Shevna Creek isn't dated. Uh, it's north of De Zavala as well, because if you go straight up, there's a bunch of houses that have their backyards facing Northwest Military, and I called a number of people that live there, and they're like, well, good, then when my fence falls down, you should fix it. If I let it you know, crumble, then you should fix it. And it's on their property. So it's not just gated neighborhoods. And so, I mean, I just have a concern about starting the ball. Well, I would love to be able to say, okay, it's easy. It's a step. I think it's ugly. I look at it every single day, numerous times a day, coming in and out of my driveway. But I just don't think it's right. How does it affect property values in the community? <clears throat> I don't think it affects the overall property values except for that particular property. Um, as far as, you know, if I had to sell a house that had a wall like that, that wall would have to be fixed before someone would pay top dollar for that property. But if I am selling a house on Ben Oak and they have to look at Basil's, they're not going to say, oh, I'm not going to buy here because that wall's there. Like so, that. so if you live right next to, so if you lived right next to Basil uh, on Warbler, would that affect your property value? Would you think about buying the house next door to Basil's? Or would would that be a, a selling point? Or would that be a negotiating point of, well, the value used to be X and now it's Y? Well, the value of Basil's house would go down, not him and, you know, not trying to make say him, but the house with the injured wall, that value property would go down. That doesn't mean the rest of the area would go down. You would assume then you would want to have them fix it because you don't want to live next door to that. But that doesn't mean that the property that's being sold that has a good wall isn't going to sell for a, a good value. I mean, I, I just don't see that. Okay. Does anybody else have any new points? I just have a question. Yes. Uh, maybe two. Personally, I look at this similarly to the oak wolf and tree uh, issue. Okay? Trees are a huge component of this community. If something happens in this community and oak wolf goes through, changes the way this community looks. And when we voted, these were some of the same arguments, you know, tax dollars and folks that 
have trees that were not impacted, well, could, could still be impacted. The second point is that fence is very, um, in, a, in a part of our community that is very visible. And it does impact the way we are viewed and, and the way it looks. Uh, so those are the two points that I want to make. I, I, I think that those, are, those two issues are more alike than they're not. Um, the only question that I have is why would this council vote to spend tax dollars this time when it didn't previously? No. Help me here. I can answer part of that because I looked at the city packet uh, council from it's either late 2012 or early 13, I think it was late 12. In that council packet, the city manager wrote up the summary with no legal opinion. And he absolutely stated very strongly that it was prohibited by law to expend public funds on private property. The entire argument was made, uh, now there was an attorney here, and I don't know who that attorney was. I, might, I researched that with uh, Charlie, it was probably his predecessor associated with it, but I don't know. And there was no legal documentation, but the city manager's right up picture it now because I just researched it in uh, last month. It, it left no option if, if, if you were to believe that memo associated with that. So all I have done is said legally you have to you can determine if there's a public purpose, but if there's a public purpose, light drainage, which a lot of these drainage projects are going to be on private property. Some will be in a right away, but most of them have a component of private property which we will be expending in some cases, hundreds of thousands of dollars for five or eight people. And so there's a, you know, there is a correlation between Oakwell, which we went on six properties, we trenched, and we spent probably what was it, 40,000 in total when we did that on private property and public property to prevent an outbreak of that Oakwell Center. The last thing that I want to say, if, <laughs> I hope Bob is happy about this, but I recognize the desire not to spend tax dollars. Um, my, my desire would be that we take some extra time and we ask then communities to pay for it. If we can't get a consensus to do that, then um, the $20,000 that's on the table for this is about the amount of money that gets spent on parties that some people in the community aren't, aren't all that happy about. And so, if we can vote for that, we should also be able to vote for this to be spent for this fence. Oh, Mike. I knew that was going to come up. The parties are on municipal property that is open to every citizen in this community to come. Period. That wall is deeded to those people. Now you can you can say that, that 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 we should do this for the good of the city. Okay, that's fine. I'm saying that we can do this, but downstream there's going to be people who are going to say you did it for them. Why aren't you doing it for me? And I know we're trying to put into this some kind of uh, contract that says this is a one-time deal. We're not going to do it anymore. But that's not going to hold up because somebody's going to sue the city to try and get. It down the road. It will happen, and y'all know this. It's going to happen. There will be payback on this. I, I hate to have to do this. Basil Karcher is a personal friend of mine. And I know, we, you know, let him put whatever wall he wants there. Why does it have to be a rock wall? It was a two-foot wall with a, with a cog bar fence before. <coughs> I don't know the whole details of what it was years ago. The mayor said it was a two-foot wall originally, and there was a time that there was, you can see the posts and the wire in there. That's what it was, and that's what the deed restrictions call for, but the deed restrictions call for a six-foot wall. No, as far the, as deed, the deed restrictions don't call for a six-foot wall. It says yeah. right here. It says I, I don't... It, oh, says, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't specify the nature it's of the six-foot wall. No, it says it's six-foot. Yeah. Depending upon which property yeah. it is. Uh, they were bought at different property. It says uh, it shall be six feet wall. It yeah. shall be a six foot rock wall, substantially identical in design 
uh, and materials to the wall adjacent to Northwest Military Highway and Shadow Park Unit 15A. Concrete footings adequate to support the wall shall be part of the required construction. Right. But but they're uh, Mike, so they're they're it, different properties that have different limitations. Okay, well, this is Basil's. So if he didn't yeah. build it right when he rebuilt it, then it's his problem. I, I would like to I'm not trying to be argumentative. I included all DCCRs from Shadow Creek to illustrate there's different requirements for each section. The section that is Basil's requires a fence to be built substantially the same as the fence, which is the two foot, which would have been the two foot. It doesn't say what the composition was. So in that one it says fence, in the second one it says fence, in the third one, which was done later as the development, it said wall, and it was very specific to the wall. It was, I mean, it doesn't probably make a big difference in your point. I'm not trying to say that. Uh, but well, I've talked to Basil a number of times over this over the years, and he would just, he'd like to have a wall, but if he has to pay for the whole thing, he just as soon go ahead and put a, a, a board fence on his section. And I don't see why we should stop that. And by keep coming up to, <coughs> to the city with this, it makes it look like we want, the city wants this rock wall there. And if that's what we're going to do, then we should own the rock wall. Why don't we let them decide what they want? Why don't we let them take it down if they want? Because why don't they, we let them put up a fence? I mean, he's under the impression that he has a deed restriction that there are these to do that. Covenants and Denton wrote them. Can't we amend the covenants? Can't we? The, the, the covenants. The covenants own all the rights in the in the deed restrictions, not in communities. He has no relationship with those covenants going forward because he doesn't own any of the properties. He but can't who? sue. Then, Didn't develop. No, I recognize that. I, I'm saying, why don't we let these homeowners be zoned the same way that the rest of the community is, and let them decide what kind of fence they want to put up. And, and they have a contract between themselves, among themselves. We have, we, and a contract we can't. Between who? The, the deed covenants are a contract the, each they, other, it, the between each other. Okay. The neighbors have a contract, and depending on when their properties were platted, if the, the homeowners who were platted at the same time as Basil's house was platted all have the right to bring an action against Basil for that rock wall, if they want to. And Frankly, the idea of neighbors suing neighbors to get a rock wall fixed when we can avoid that type of acrimony in our community for $20,000 seems, why would we want to encourage somebody to sue his neighbor? I don't know, another previous council voted no. But, but Bill explained why the no, previous council did, or he, I think Bill tried to explain that he told that the previous city council member, Bill, correct me if I'm if I heard you Can wrong. Can I answer that? Because I was the only one on council at the time. Well and the only one here at the time. And I voted no because I was told by our attorney at the time it was an aesthetic issue and there was no public purpose and therefore we should not put money out. That's why we voted no. Period. And, and you had an opinion from an attorney that said that that is the nature of the law. Yes. Okay, Clarissa, has the law evolved any in over this period of time? It has, I don't know if it's evolved. I know that the memo that Dan put together, and that I agree with that, sure. the aesthetics can be considered a public purpose. Depends on, you know, the, the circumstances around it. So, that's so that mind. has changed since we voted. Okay, thank you. I don't disagree that council was told that they shouldn't do that, and, and council did exactly the right thing by following the recommendation of their attorneys. I'm just answering Marianne's question. And the, the question that you have tonight is, we've been told that it could be a public purpose if we have a finding of a public purpose. If we have a finding of a public purpose, we can work to develop a solution for our citizens, and Bill has been working very diligently to bring Denton to the community didn't communities to the table to participate in a settlement and uh, to participate in a solution, not a settlement, but in a solution for this. Um, the first time I talked to Bill about this matter, the answer was, we're not going to pay for a penny of it. And I told him, I don't think that we can get city council to participate at a high enough level that the homeowners would want to build their wall. And Bill was persistent and, and talked to Denton communities on many occasions and eventually got to, hey, we'll pay up to a third. So are we calling the question? 
I think that I've had somebody call the question. The question has been called. There being no further discussion, all in favor of finding and repairing the wall to have a public purpose and to authorize the city manager to expeditiously coordinate repair of the fallen portions of the wall on Northwest Military in cooperation with the property owners in Denton slash Bitter Blue with Denton on the property or the prop uh, with Denton or the property owners to take the lead and the city contribute not more than twenty thousand dollars to be taken from fund balance with the remaining of with the remainder of the cost being borne by the other parties. It is a motion by Mike Simpson and seconded by Bob. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, same aye. sign. Aye. The motion carries. Thank you. I, I know that everybody has, I want to thank council for the extended debate on the item. Uh, there was a lot of passion that went into the extended debate on the item. Uh, I hope that we have reached a solution for the near term, if not the long term. I want to thank Bill for getting us to the point that we could reach this answer. Um, and. You know, we will all go forward and we can differ on many issues and we will differ on many issues over the coming year, but this is a new year and we will work together for the following months. Okay, item 6.4, crime report. Chief Lacey, come and tell us the good news and um, hopefully not any bad news that you wanna, that we have to be shared. Uh, I'm, I'm going to, it's almost nine o'clock. I'd, I'd like for council members to have a chance to take a, a short recess Biological. of five minutes if, uh, if we could do that. Do I have a... I'm fine if we just keep going and those who have to have a break should take it. Yeah. Well, I you. <laughs> Y'all don't want to stand up and stretch your legs for a minute? Let's get it done. Okay. Very good. Chief, come on down. Just <laughs> really good. We'll see you uh, next year. Members of the council, uh, I'm pleased tonight to bring you the 2017 crime report. It's the second crime report I've brought to you all, but it's the first one with me being your police chief for the entire year. Um, we overall handled 2.8% more calls. We handled 2,797 calls from here. Our burglaries of homes, we, we had four, 50% reduction from the year before. Uh, business or building burglaries were an 82% reduction, we had three. Uh, the biggest one that I really liked was our burglary of a vehicle. We brought it down to 13 for the year, a 74% reduction. Uh, we did have 22 thefts, which uh, over the 17 the year before, so that's a 29% increase. And we had one robbery in the city, it was a business robbery. And because of that, and because we had zero before, it's a 100% increase, but we had one. But overall, the, the biggest part I think that's important is um, through the different efforts we've done, we brought our crime numbers down 48% uh, during the 2017 calendar. Um, again, the, the largest increase of anything we had was the thefts with 22. Uh, of that 22, 11 of those were a lot of equipment and tailgates that were stolen. We had seven lawn equipment thefts and four tailgates. So about 11 of those. And we've actually made several arrests off of the lawn equipment arrests. Uh, we didn't catch anybody with the tailgates. Um, we, we now, in fact, just this week, my detective is filing a third case on the same young man who comes out here and steals lawn equipment. We, we arrest him, we put him in jail, and he gets out of jail, he, 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 he has some chemical issues. Does he get them from uh, open garages, or does yep. he get them from commercial? This has all been the folks that come to mow your yards, and they, they, they leave it on their truck while they're in your backyard, or they leave it in the yard, and when they come back, it's gone. Um, and, and honestly, the biggest problem we have on trying to really clear those kinds of calls is the same problem that we all have, including myself, and that is we own equipment, but we don't own the serial number. We didn't keep up with it, and without the serial number, I can't say that that echo blower is your echo blower. It could be anyone's echo blower, unless you have some markings on it that you can identify. Uh, but
but we, we've tried really hard to do that and, and have dug up some paper So that's one of the reasons we're final on this a couple of times. Um, anyway, um, officers make 2,630 citizen contacts for here. That's where they're driving around and they see you and they pull up and talk to you. Uh, 480 homes were checked. That's 480 separate homes, not how many times. So it doesn't matter if we checked your home for one day or we checked it because you were going for three months. It only counts one time. So that's 480 separate times that we had a home to check. Um, so the number obviously would go way up if we looked at how many people went through. We did file 60 cases with the district attorney. Um, that means they were not uh, the level of a traffic ticket. Um, DWI thefts like the young man's, those kind of deal what those are for. Um, the officers, even while doing all of this, I, I would like to point out down there that uh, we completed during this last calendar year 3,135 hours of training, both internal training and training at like the academy or other locations. That's advanced training, so I haven't seen anyone through the academy. Um, we, we have 100% of the police department now trained in de-escalation and crisis awareness, and they're all now um, certified as mental health officers with either the certification or the training and they're waiting on their extra year because you have to have so many years as a police officer first. Uh, but 100% of my full-time staff now are trained, which is a phenomenal feat that I don't think you'll find hardly any agency in the state has done. But it was a goal that I had, and Mr. Hill backed me up on that, and we've sent our officers to do that. And consequently, this year in the legislature, what have they demanded that we teach? Mm -hmm de-escalation training under the Santa Plan Act. So we, I, I knew that was going to come. It was ahead of the game, and we've actually jumped ahead for that. Um, the addition of the two extra positions that y'all allowed me to put on board, I think helped with these numbers and helped with our visibility, obviously. Um, we are looking at, uh, my staff and I, uh, we're constantly looking at, and I'm working on some things now, uh, on some other methods that we might can continue to improve our services to the city with uh, our staff. Uh, the examination and the advanced equipment that y'all allowed us to get this past calendar year, uh, fiscal year in October, um, we're, we're <coughs> utilizing. It's helping with the officers being able to see things out there and to do their work. Uh, we're continuing to explore other ways to collect evidence, uh, to assist in prosecutions, and to control any of the crime. So as your police chief, I'm very committed to providing that exceptional level of service that we've been doing. Um, I'm very committed to the continued officer and citizen contact and team efforts that we have in solving our crimes. Uh, the staff of the police department, I feel, has done an exceptional job in doing what they're here to do. Uh, I'm very proud to be a member of that team of their police department, and I'm also very proud to be your police chief. If you have any questions over any of the information we have, yes, sir. Well, first of all, I think you guys have done a great job, and Chief, I think personally you've, you've implemented some things that have made a big difference in our city. I, you kind of stole my thunder because I was going to ask you if you had to choose one thing. Well, maybe I didn't. If you had to choose one reason why you think crime has decreased or you, you guys have made an impact, what would that be? It sounds like the two officers made a difference. Um, the community uh, contact, would you say that would be the other? I think that the interaction with the community, both talking with the community and being seen in the neighborhoods, when I implemented all of our excess time to be in the neighborhoods more, uh, is a big effect. One of the problems in, in determining crime prevention is you can't really put a method to something that didn't occur. So we just have to work with what has been known over all the years to work with. The, the more bodies you have roaming around in black and white cars, to, to some level, is going to make a difference. Um, having the citizens being involved as they are, when they do see something, they pick up that phone, they dial 911, and we're there with the just a minute or two. I think that makes a big effect. So I, I think they all cohesively work together to make this um, be a lower crime. I also think that during the the time from October of 2016 when I came on board to present, we speak with all of the criminals that we catch, um, the car burglars especially, and we, we have a real little huddle about what are you doing here and why you don't want to ever come back here. And 
I think that affects what they're doing too, because when the bad guys know that we know who they are and that we're going to find them, and that every time they come back, if, if you do five burglaries, we're going to follow five burglaries on you. We're not going to be like San Antonio and follow one. It, um, we pointed that out last year when we, we caught the three folks that did the five burglaries over off a happy trail and up onto uh, the cliffsides. That was 15 cases we had to put together, five per person. But we filed on all three people, five cases. And when they walked into court and those cases were stacked on, it, it has a profound effect. Plus the district attorney gets a lot more leverage. And, and we stringently ask the district attorney to use that leverage to our best advantage. So that very last slide was going to make one of the comment that I just noticed. It seems like habitation, uh, Burglar habitation has decreased, which is fantastic. But uh, the very last slide that you threw up there uh, showed the vacation home checks, which I, my question for you is, is it's gone, if you look at 13 all the way to today, it's gone down significantly um, from that year to this year, and, and certainly in all years, 17 was the, the least. Is that, a, is that a reason because we've had so many new communities and new homes built People don't know about that service, we're not promoting it, or are we just not getting, I'm just asking that question as to why, how, how can we make a difference there? Um, I, I think that, I mean, we promote it on our webpage, we talk to folks about it. Uh, it it's not something that we stretch out, it, it's a reactionary thing for right. our part. Right. So if, if 490 people had asked, then we would have had the extra 10. We certainly can push that information out more. And as we do more these, I make a lot of the HOA meetings, and I'll, I'll even be here for Bentley Manor's Thursday. Uh, I, I tend to bring that up as one of the things that we do often. Uh, it, it isn't uncommon in the smaller cities that, that's still there. What is uncommon is the, the level and quality of, of customer care and service that we as a law enforcement agency can give a city that that even some of the small cities don't or can't, they, don't, they either don't have the budget or they don't have the personnel. So I, I think we're doing good even with that, sir. But oh, no, I agree. I, I don't think that's a bad, I'm just, I'm just wondering why the number's going down, and I just mm -hmm. think it's something, I know I've used that service with, right. since 17 we, years we ago. Actually, I think it's a very good. Yeah, we're, we're working very hard. In fact, I've worked with uh, Curtis very, very closely. I, I'm trying to automate that a little more in that you will, fill out the form online. We have it that way now. You can fill the form online, unlike the old one where you printed it out and just hand it. It's a, P a fillable PDF. We're, we're moving towards the final stage of that where you will actually pull it up, hit the send button, and it will just print out here. And it won't matter where you're at. You you may forget to tell us, and when you land in Paris, France, you jump on a computer and you send it, and we'll get it. And you'll be able to save it so that the next time you go, you just change your dates and you'll have it all in place. I, I want to bring that into that level that I've seen with some other agencies and we're, we're working really closely. And I couldn't do that without Curtis's expertise in the IT area. So Curtis is, it, it, and that's even for us, it's a team effort. It's not just the police doing things. It's, it's the things that Curtis and his IT department has done. It's the support I've gotten from Mr. Hill. It's the support that uh, Chief Naughton gives me on some of the areas we're doing. So it, it's truly a, a big family effort to keep the crime down. Thank you, very much. Thank you very much. I appreciate. Thank you very much. I appreciate your presentation, and um, we look forward. Um, Chief, we have really enjoyed having you here. We enjoy the professionalism of all your officers. I think you've made some really great hires, uh, including the person standing at the back of the room. Uh, you're to be commended on the professionalism of your staff. Thank you on behalf of all the council members. Item 6.5, discussion and action transfer portion of fund balance to capital replacement improvement fund. Bill? Um, the bottom line on this is in accordance with our fund balance policy, we should not maintain an unassigned fund balance of 50% of our current budget. There's $271,000, I rounded up, uh, so, uh, that currently exists on, on unassigned to the fund balance that council can consider that amount or a different amount more or less associated with uh, uh, the transfer of fund balance. So 
what our policy says, and I didn't read it all, but it's in your packet that we uh, will consider that, consider transferring it to the capital improvement fund. And so, in today's action, council should decide that they want to um, assign the $271,000 to cap if you want to consider assigning it. And if you do, under which category you want to do that. Drainage, relocation of water lines is an example. Other like fire, police or public works. Uh, the other option is you can leave it as is. Uh, and it can be considered in the budget process. But okay. typically, we have in the past few years considered it during this time period. Last year, we did not transfer anything because we were at 49.8% and something of that nature. The year before, we already mentioned that we transferred a significant amount of over a million dollars to various different fund areas. Okay. Now, before I recognize council members uh, for a motion, I, I just want a clarification on the amount that was projected as we were going through the budget process. Uh, I think we anticipated a fund balance at the end of the year. Is this close or is this way over? Um, I, it looks like it's about 80, it feels about $80,000 heavier than what we talked about. I thought we were talking about 137000 and this is two hundred seventy-one. It's It's actually, uh, it's over, it's significantly over. Uh, and do we have a reason why that happened? Because, you know, we, 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 you know, fund balance is nice. Is it because we didn't spend money? Is it because we had unexpected revenues? Yeah. Is yes. She already yes. covered it. Okay. Yeah, yeah so uh, even though we did the budget, uh, we received slightly more in, uh, after the last amendment in sales tax, as well as uh, permit, fees. The permit fees and even at the one taxes. Mm -hmm. Even EMS. In EMS. So then, then there was a reduction in cost of fuel across the board, but also, uh, as Laura mentioned, for the salaries. Uh, the, uh, the salaries. So she made that better, right? Oh, well, I saw, uh, yeah, yeah. listen to The legal was 35, from reading off her notes, 35,000 less than we had budgeted. Well, good. Can we do that again? Well, we, yeah. we reduced it this year as well. Mike. Mr. Mayor, I would move that we amend the budget to transfer excess fund balance of 251000 and I'll explain that if I get a second, to the fire department capital replacement fund line of a ladder truck. And here's, here's the motion. Okay. Um, a motion to transfer the excess fund balance of $251,000 to the fire department capital replacement fund as a line item for a ladder truck. Uh, do I have a second? I'll second. Okay, we, we're now open for discussion. Mike? Uh, first, to explain the amount, we just voted to spend $20,000 from the uh, budget um, excess, or ex excess fund balance, so that brought it down to uh, 251. And we're gonna need a new truck and we need to put the money away for it, and this is a good place to put it, I believe. Okay. Now, you specified a ladder truck, and of course, uh, we recognize that in any budget that um, all unrestricted funds other than uh, bond funds and, and funds of that type, that once we put them into a category, it's still fungible from council to council, and so that while we may designate this as a ladder truck, it could actually wind up being just any truck, or it could just be uh, anything in the fire department, or it could actually ultimately be moved from the fire department to roads or to some other purpose, but that you're asking that we call it, for now, a ladder truck. That's correct, sir. Okay. Do we have any discussion? Michelle? Uh, council hasn't approved a ladder truck, so I don't agree with that. And I also would like to amend it to just have staff recommend where it should go in the capital replacement improvement fund, and we don't need to dictate where. Okay, uh, now that, that sounded like a motion to substitute. Uh, are you making a motion to substitute? Yes. Okay, your motion to substitute would be to amend the budget to transfer excess funds uh, of the amount specified uh, to capital and improvements and replacements as specified by the city manager. Is that correct? In the amount of 251,000 because I agree with that. Okay, so we're gonna leave the additional 20 in the... Budget for the wall repair. Okay. Um, do I have a second on the motion to substitute? Second. 
We have a second on the motion to substitute, which would put this into uh, capital replacement to be designated by the city manager. We're open for discussion on the motion to substitute. I just wanted to say that there are a number of things that the money could go for, and I think that <coughs> staff should be the one to recommend where it would be best served. Okay, do we, Bob? I would agree with that uh, assessment, although I would say that, uh, and I'm not in, in agreement with, with a fire truck at this point until it's agreed upon by uh, city council, but I think we've just agreed that we're going to spend on a minimum 361000 on drainage plus a, a uh, additional fees for the planning of the next phase. Um, so I would like to either propose this option or even amend it, amend it to have this money go into drainage specifically. Well, and, and based on the motion with the second, uh, the motion to substitute, the city manager can make that recommendation. Right. Uh, and I don't know if you spoke to that purpose, but that would be one of the options that would be available. Do we have any further discussion on the motion to substitute? Mr. Mayor. Yes, Mike. I have spoken to staff, and that was the genesis of my motion, so we can kick it down the line if you want to, but I think the original motion should stand. So I would speak against the motion to substitute. Okay. Do we have any further discussion? Okay. We have a motion to substitute to amend the budget to transfer excess fund balance of $251,000 to the capital replacement improvement fund uh, at, to be allocated according to the recommendation of the city manager. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Aye. The motion carries. Uh, the motion to substitute is now the primary motion. Do we have any discussion on the primary motion? Okay, there being no discussion on the primary motion, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. The motion carries. Aye. Item 6.6, .6, discussion action purchase additional water rights in lieu of renewal of the existing Edwards Aquifer water leases. Bill? Should be pretty easy. This one should be fairly easy. Uh, Edwards Aquifer Okay, so again, we considered this last year and worked through the uh, Water Advisory Committee and we basically came up with a proposal to, over the next 10 years, buy 130 acre feet, which in our assessment, instead of leasing uh, several hundred... Just, just, feet, just a second before we go on, um, it's a budget amendment uh, where there's going to be an ordinance. Bill is going to bring us back the specific recommendations, and that will be at the next city council member. I, I didn't want y'all to think, or for the public, if they're watching the video, to think that, oh, we just told Bill to go and do whatever. He's going to bring this back as a budget amendment. And um, I wanted to clarify that for the people watching because the people in the room know that. But uh, just sorry, Bill. I apologize. I should have thought about the last. Agenda item. The last agenda item, yes. Well, yes. Um, again, previously through the WAC, the council uh, approved 13 acre feet. That was part of a plan over 10 years to purchase 130 total acre feet. As of three or four years ago, we were leasing five, 600 acre feet to provide that cushion associated with what. Well, what acre feet rights, what water rights we own in Edwards Aquifer, what might be required of us in a stage three, stage four situation where you have to own uh, up to 40% more than you, your rights or you have to have some ownership or lease agreement of up to 40% what you currently own or what you're currently using in a drought period. Okay, so. Previously, what we had done was we leased a bunch of water rights. We have been letting those leases expire with the idea that um, we really had a 38, 35, 40% decline in the demand of usage of water. Um, that's not a scientific number, but it's a, it's a swag. And that um, we brought the Trinity online, and if we were to uh, purchase 130 acre feet, we would have about 1,000. Um, 1,002 acre feet under the current number of users we have, it would be an adequate cushion for what we would anticipate, not only now, but in the future, in case, for example, the Trinity Well um, uh, 
um, which I'm not producing very much. I, I provide a lot of background information in your packet. I'm not going to uh, discuss it with, uh, in great detail unless you want me to. We did, again, purchase 13 acre feet last year. We've closed on that effective 1 January. Um, Wardog, which is the uh, regional water advisory committee that we deal with, that we contract with, and we're a membership of, and they actually purchase it and do all the arrangements with us. They've asked for a data call for all cities. If you want to purchase new or at least new water rights, you get that request into them early. So this is before the budget cycle. What I'm looking for is an approval from council to proceed with the purchase of 13 acre feet. It would, uh, in accordance with the 10 year plan, this would be budgeted in the FY 18-19 uh, budget cycle, but I need to take the action now. So I, what I'm asking for is the consent approval here now from uh, actually the actual approval from the city council. I will be bringing it back uh, with the anticipated purchase price budgeted in the budget for next year because it won't be effective until, again, 1 January 19, but you've got to get ahead of that. Uh, we did budget uh, last year $5,500 an acre foot. We actually only paid $5,000 per acre foot, and we were able to get actually the cheapest um, amount per acre feet of those that were in our region associated with that. And that was perhaps luck, but hmm. that, that, probably because it was a 13 acre foot, not a, thousand, not a hundred or not a, a 57, not a larger number of acre feet. So, Again, um, we brought this before the Water Advisory Committee on January 8th. They approved a recommendation to City Council for the purchase of an additional 13 acre feet. Um, there is a uh, impact between five and six thousand dollars per acre feet, which is 65 to 78 thousand um, dollars. We're asking a motion to approve the purchase of the additional 13 acre feet for Edwards Aquifer for 2019, and that request will be uh, requested again and budgeted in the budget process. Okay. Uh, do we have a motion? I do. Bob? Uh, motion to uh, authorize city manager and staff to purchase additional water rights in lieu of renewal of existing Edwards Aquifer for water leases year 2019. Second. Approved the purchase of additional 13 acre fee of Edwards Aquifer rights for 2019 will be requested and later budgeted. Okay. Uh, we have a motion and we have a second from Michelle. Do we have any discussion? There being no discussion, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. The motion carries. Item 6.7, discussion action appointment of council appointed positions, bank services, city medical director, IT services. Bill. So, uh, again, we started this at the request of council a couple years ago. Take a look at the services that you get contracted. Make sure you're putting eyes on it every few years, maybe depending on what the cycle is, and so that you know, you're not just assuming that we have a service and it, um, it is what it is. So um, we have, based upon that, gone out for requests for proposal, requests for qualifications, and at other times we have said we've looked at that and we're happy with a certain element and we're requesting that we don't go through that. Uh, this year, uh, we really had uh, three services that we wanted to review and then uh, and get guidance from council on. That's the medical director who really works uh, as, as, as under our EMS works under his license. Oftentimes, as I understand it, on EMS calls, they're actually in communication with the director. Um, you know, this guy provides um, very reasonable cost uh, fees. FOSS Bank is the, is the next one in IT services. Um, I'll just kind of say that um, in summary, the, uh, the fire chief and I, but mostly the fire chief, um, very satisfied with, um, with our medical director. And uh, he's provided great service to us at one of the lowest prices that is around. Our IT services, we actually renegotiated the contract last year and we actually got a reduction in cost associated with that. But uh, it's auto-renewed every year. Um, and so Curtis and I talked about, we actually really seriously considered going out again, but uh, the team that they've got 
knows us. They've been, they're so reactive. Uh, we've got one of the lowest IT services costs that's out there. We're very happy. We want to, um, we want to, we intend to auto renew it uh, again unless uh, told otherwise. The uh, bank services with Fox Bank, we're very satisfied with that. Um, Actually, Laura and I had a conversation in the investment committee about that today. Um, but by law, we're required to be five years to go out for a request for proposal. That uh, contract we currently have expires in December of 2018. So again, we're 11 months out. But since this is the time we do the annual review, um, we know that by law, we have to do the, uh, the bank uh, we uh, are proposing that we only issue a request for proposal for banking services, um, and that that's what all we do. We've done the review of the other two, and we didn't see that as uh, required. Okay. Um, well, I think council is actually reviewing these, so I think the council should actually make a motion to continue the services of Dr. Richard N. Uh, Terpoli. Terpoli. Uh, and to continue the services of HRT services and then also to make a request for proposal for banking services. Do I have a motion? So moved. Okay, uh, we have a motion from uh, Mike Simpson to continue our current physician in his position as our medical director to continue HRT services both at the recommendation of council and to go out for a request for proposal. We have a second on that motion? Second. It's HTS. HTS, yes. I'm, I'm sorry. I said that. I wrote it down right, but I said it wrong. Okay, and a second from uh, Mike Colmere. Um, do we have any discussion on this? There being no discussion, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. The motion carries. Item 6.8, discussion action authorizing the city manager, manager to enter into a contract to hire an interim financial director. Bill, do you want to give us an overview on this and uh, tell us uh, what your recommendation is? I think we can be brief. Uh, Laura Fegans, our finance director, has indicated that she is going to uh, uh, depart Chapel Park sometime probably in February, and we're working through that um, that timeline. Um, um, she's been fantastic and committed to a professional transition associated with that, but in the meantime, um, we are going to need to get a interim finance director into the city um, and or if there's applications that are received that are qualified and we deem that we approve that we would uh, we, we, I would come back to the city council and say well, I don't need an interim but uh, we've got a qualified person we're going to select right now we have a, we've received uh, at least one application but uh, the period just began last week uh, rather the notification just began last week I believe I need to come to city council because we would probably contract with Texas first, and that would be an obligation of funds, which is not uh, which is not salaried, which is not budgeted yet. The, uh, the typical cost is, as I understand it, uh, the cost of the salary plus 10 percent, and uh, that would go on. Uh, there might also be um, cost associated with a per diem if the person came out of town and or travel costs, you know, uh, over here, it's, it might it have to be negotiated twice a month, travel from wherever they work, so as I understand it. And, and I've talked to Zena, Zena's not here, she's done this a number of times, and it, it, it is mission dependent on, uh, you know, the cost dependent upon uh, getting it. someone's qualified to be the interim, as a familiarization with government accounting, in code, et cetera, and being able to uh, manage those finances between the time. Okay, uh, Bill, unfortunately, we haven't posted this to give you authorization to hire a city uh, a right. financial right. manager. Right. This is just. For of the, uh, okay, the because you talked about that, and I just wanted to clarify that that's not because one of our options. Hire someone, thanks for clear. I would bring that back as a separate. You said that? Yeah. Okay, uh, do we have a motion to authorize the city manager to enter into a contract to hire an interim financial director? So moved. Okay, we have a motion from Michelle. Do we have a second? Second. We have a second from Mike Simpson. Do we have any discussion? There being no discussion, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. The motion carries. 
Item 7, all matters listed under this item are considered routine by the City Council and will only be considered at the request of one or more aldermen coincident with each listed item. Discussion will generally occur. Does anybody want to pull any of the items 7.1 through 7.6? Okay, there being no indication, we will now go to item 8. All matters listed under this item are considered routine by the City Council and will be enacted by one motion. There will not be a separate discussion on these items. If discussion is desired by any alderman on any item, that item will be removed from the consent agenda and will be considered separately. Do we have a motion to approve or accept items 8.1 through 8.7? So moved. I'd yes, like Mike. To remove 8.6, Okay, uh, we have had a request to remove 8.6 by Mike Simpson. Do I have a motion to uh, approve items eight, uh, approve or accept items 8.1 through 8.5 and 8.7? So moved. Michelle has made a motion on items 8.1 through 8.5 and item 8.7. Do I have a second? Second. Uh, Mike Simpson has seconded the motion. There being no discussion, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. The motion carries. Brings us back to item 8.6. Uh, it's a um, resolution R2018-001, ordering the tw May 5th, 2018 general special uh, election of three aldermen and a special election authorizing the street maintenance sales tax at a rate of one quarter of one percent to provide revenue for maintenance and repair of municipal streets. I'm glad that you pulled this because Bill needs to tell us what's happening in Bear County about this as well. So Bill, why don't you tell us about the resolution that you're, uh, the resolution that's before us? Okay, the election officer is absent. Yeah, so, as we normally have every day, we have an election for either three aldermen or two aldermen and a mayor, and that is included in this resolution. In addition, uh, because we have a street sales tax and that is um, uh, required to be put before the voters for a validation if you want to continue that every four years, then um, if this is the year that we're required to do that. Next year it will be the Crime Control Prevention District uh, funding associated with that. The city can allocate um, up to two cents of its sales tax to different entities and, or to different funds. Currently we have 1% allocated towards the general fund, 0.5% uh, 1% to the uh, 0.25 to street tax and 0.25 to the crime control prevention district budget. So this proposal would uh, continue to have that authorization of sales tax at the rate of one fourth of a percent for revenue to be used for the maintenance and repair of the municipal streets. Um, so this resolution orders the general and the special election. Okay. Uh, Bill, Tommy Covert had talked about uh, coordinating all the elections in Bear County and Chavanaugh Park at the same time. Uh, did we get any further clarification on that or what did the Bear County Election uh, Commission tell us? And, uh, so, there was at um, a Bear County suburban coalition of suburban cities a discussion of that. It was unclear as to exactly which <coughs> dates that we were talking about. Bear County runs a number of elections that are separate from the traditional Texas municipal elections, which is uh, in this case May uh, 5th. They do a they do preliminaries, they do runoffs, they do the general election, then they have runoffs, and there's a there's a runoff on the on, uh, in, in May as well. So there's, there's all that. There was confusion and, and when asked, he didn't really understand which elections he was talking about because the elections commission was actually in training was not there. It was, it was, there is a general proposal or an idea that we should consolidate elections from Bear County and all municipalities so that there, there's one effort. But there really wasn't a lot of detailed discussion, no follow-up has occurred. Okay, I was curious because um, you know it costs us money to maintain or to run our city elections, and if we could run them in tandem with the county on the other elections that are up in the same cycle, it would be a cost-sharing opportunity, which could potentially save our city some amount of money. It's just a couple thousand dollars. It's 
Yeah, it saves us a little bit. It also it also removes the inconvenience of this being an early voting location for all of those other elections because we would just be running our own early voting and they would have the other people that would be here at the same time, which is confusing because people come here thinking that they can vote for everything early. Okay, so uh, do uh, do we have a motion? Oh. Yeah, you pulled Mike. Up for something. Yeah, the reason that I asked to talk about it is because uh, attached to the resolution is an order for the election and that order is for 2014 um, and we need to make yeah. sure that as we approve the resolution that we don't approve that order. That's true. Zena said she was going to bring us an order later but as the packet is built it looks like we're approving both and we don't want to approve, re approve 2014. Yeah, so uh, Mike, you sent a note on that. Zena came in this afternoon, and she noticed that in the Word of document that she attached, when she did it, say PDF, it was an old file. She removed that, and I don't know if you've got it on your screen. I've got it on mine where it's removed now, and that she reposted the the packet even online through the uh, website that it, sh it should be cleared out. With. Okay. Um, so, but that was a a good catch, and she did not intend for that document to be included in the packet. Okay. Um, so assuming that it has been corrected or, or subject to correction, do we have a, a motion to approve resolution R-2018-001 ordering the May 5th, 2018 special general, general special election to elect three aldermen and a special election Authorizing the street maintenance sales tax at the rate of one fourth of one percent to provide revenue for maintenance and repair of municipal streets, subject, of course, to correction. So moved. Uh, Mike has made a motion. Mike Simpson has made a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Michelle has seconded the motion. Is there any discussion? There being no discussion, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. The motion carries. Brings us to item number nine motion to adjournment. Do we have a motion to adjourn? So Michelle has made a motion to adjourn. Do we have a second? second. Mike Colmere has seconded the motion. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. The motion carries.